The main character named Charlie comes to the first central hospital of his city to consult with an ophthalmologist. The doctor checks with Charlie about his details and asks him again about the symptoms he is complaining about. Charlie says that for some reason his eyes sometimes don't see very clearly. According to him, when looking at an object, he often sees a red stripe with numbers that hovers above it. The doctor asks Charlie how much he sees on this strip, to which he is told that the number 18 is lit on the strip. Suddenly, Charlie decides to ask the doctor if this number is his age. The doctor is a little perplexed by this question and mentally asks himself whether Charlie is in the wrong department. Charlie wonders if these numbers are an indicator of death and misses the question from the doctor. Charlie sincerely apologizes for this, saying that he was a little distracted by his thoughts. The doctor tells the main character that he should take this examination more seriously and suggests that he examine his eyes. During a standard eye exam, the doctor finds no abnormalities and concludes that Charlie's eyes look normal. Suddenly, a new attack hits Charlie and his eyes are covered with a red veil. He walks down the corridor and notices that each person has a stripe above their head, reflecting their life force. Charlie is glad that he can now see everything clearly enough and heads home. Charlie leaves First General Hospital, passing an advertisement for the Night Watch unit. This advertisement claims that in the 99th year of the Cataclysm, a safe place has finally been created while others continue to retreat. Charlie doesn't pay much attention to the advertisement and is walking home when suddenly his shoelaces come undone. As he bends down to tie them, he suddenly realizes that his surroundings have changed. Looking up, Charlie sees his city in front of him, only distorted and shrouded in dark shadows. Suddenly, a woman rushes past him, apparently not even noticing his presence. She and several other fighters attack otherworldly creatures that live in this world. Charlie looks at the battle and notes that things here don't look so good for the people. Before his eyes appears an unknown creature, shaped like the sun, with exorbitant vital signs. However, large and luminous heavenly drops suddenly begin to fly from the sky. Drops fall on the forehead of the main character, illuminating him with a slight glow. A split second later, Charlie comes to his senses at a crosswalk in his city. Charlie recalls that in the 99th year of the Cataclysm, the only reliable support for humanity remained the army of the Night Watch. However, the main character is tormented by the question of whether his city is really safe or whether it is all an elaborate lie. A merchant approaches Charlie and offers him to buy medicine, assuring him that the quality is the same as the official one. Charlie is surprised that the dealer is selling drugs to someone when the city is full of monsters. After a few minutes of brisk trading, Charlie buys a bottle of divine oil and boards the bus. Charlie looks out the window, wondering if he's taken everything that's just happened too seriously. The announcer on the bus announces that the transport has arrived at the Southern Street, asking passengers to prepare to leave. Suddenly, the shadows thicken around Charlie again, and he returns to the gloomy world into which he found himself a few tens of minutes ago. Charlie shakes his head and looks around again, falling back into his world. Charlie is surprised that these strange visions visit him in such a short time. He decides that upon arriving home, he will need to take a good look around and goes home. Arriving home, Charlie decides to take a shower, after which he dries himself off with a towel and turns to the mirror. Charlie notices that there is a strange pattern in his chest that seems familiar to him. Charlie remembers that he was recently looking for his comic book in the library at night, which he had left there earlier. Due to his clumsiness, Charlie drops a book with a strange design on his head. From these memories, the pattern in his chest takes on life and begins to pulsate with energy. Charlie falls to the floor clutching his chest, which begins to burn more and more. Taking the shower in his hands and pouring hot water over the area of the pattern, he manages to relieve the itching and pain, and he calms down. Charlie looks at himself in the mirror and notices that his life bar is now at its maximum. The main character is distracted from joy for himself by strange sounds behind him, which his writhing shadow begins to make. Suddenly, the shadow disappears, and Charlie begins to look for it in a panic, not understanding what is happening. Suddenly, the shadow returns to Charlie, and he calms down, saying that because of all the strange things, such events are no longer so surprising. After making sure that everything is in order, Charlie admits to himself that he is very tired and heads out of the bath. Opening the door of the room, Charlie comes face to face with a black silhouette resembling himself. After gawking at the mysterious creature, Charlie says that now miracles have definitely begun to happen in his life. The pattern on Charlie's chest begins to hurt again, and he grabs at it, trying to get his thoughts in order. Charlie is glad that his shadow has not disappeared, but the fact that it is now alive confuses him somewhat. After some time, Charlie, already dressed in his home clothes, orders the shadow to raise his hand, which it silently does. After trying a few simple commands, Charlie asks the shadow to perform some kind of dance, which also succeeds without the slightest problem. Charlie scratches his head and tries to figure out where this shadow even came from. However, his thoughts are interrupted by a light suddenly escaping from his chest, which flies into the center of the room. Wisp shows Charlie the data and characteristics of his shadow, providing the opportunity to enhance its skills. The light also gives the main character information that his shadow exists only thanks to Charlie, has all his memories and strength, and can also perform simple tasks, but does not have consciousness. Charlie decides to touch the shadow, 
and his hand passes through it, after which he realizes that the lack of consciousness deprives the shadow of the ability to speak. Charlie decides to check how similar memories he and the shadow have and decides to delve into his notebooks. The main character takes out a sheet of paper with a math assignment on it. He extends his pen to the shadow and tells her to solve these equations. Shadow easily takes it in his hands and sits down at the table, starting to solve the problem. After a short time, the shadow writes on the sheet that the equation has been solved without writing anything else. Charlie curses at the shadow, saying that it has all his memories, adding that he would have decided for himself in two minutes. He decides to pick up another task for the shadow and asks the shadow to draw a picture of a horse instead of equations. The shadow immediately gets to work, drawing the animal with incredible speed. While the shadow is busy drawing a horse, Charlie decides to look at the shadow's other abilities. Among the skills, he finds the shadow bite skill, which allows him to absorb shadows, strengthening himself and his shadow. After looking around, Charlie decides to go to the corner of his room and try to touch the shadow. Despite all the mental and physical effort Charlie put in, nothing happened. After a couple of attempts, Charlie decides to return to the screen and reads the description of the shadow pupil skill, thanks to which the wearer can see the dark side of the world. Charlie suspects that this refers to the strange visions that came to his mind. The main character tells his shadow to stop drawing and do a couple of push-ups. The shadow gets up from the chair and instead of following the order, begins to slowly merge with the floor. Despite Charlie's incomprehensible cries, his shadow sinks deeper and deeper until it finally disappears without a trace. Charlie looks around in shock, trying to figure out where his shadow went. He continues to turn his head around, demanding that the shadow immediately appear. After some time, a shadow funnel materializes in the air behind him. His shadow jumps out of it, as if from a portal, looking very pleased with itself. Charlie, however, is not very impressed with this spectacular appearance and asks her why she just ran away. Shadow takes a notepad and pen and writes about how she was on the dark side. When Charlie asks what she was doing there, the shadow writes that she was doing push-ups. Charlie suggests that shadow training works better on the dark side and asks her to continue. The shadow silently nods and disappears into the floor again, leaving Charlie alone in the room. Charlie puts away his notebooks, picks up the stylus from his graphics tablet, and decides to get down to business. However, after a while, severe fatigue makes the main character fall asleep. A scream from the front door wakes the main character from a short sleep, and he goes to the entrance to open the door for his guest. His guest turns out to be his beloved childhood friend named Carol. Carol slips into the apartment, and Charlie asks her why she came so early. Carol asks Charlie what he did yesterday, adding that she didn't really understand him from the messages on his phone. Suddenly, the deafening sound of a door closing startles Carol, and she flinches violently. Carol yells at Charlie, telling him that he could have just told her that he didn't want to talk instead of slamming the door so loudly. However, if Carol was scared by such a loud sound, Charlie was incredibly surprised at how much power he suddenly had. Carol examines Charlie and sheepishly asks him if he's pumped up. However, she quickly concludes that Charlie would rather die than practice. Coming closer, she asks the main character what he did to himself. Charlie says that he only did a few exercises, mentally guessing that the results of the shadow training are reflected on him. Carol, not satisfied with Charlie's answers, lifts up his t-shirt and examines his abs. Carol calls Charlie a liar, saying that it's so good to get abs with just a few exercises. She reports that she saw her father doing some business and says that it is not too late to stop. Charlie brushes Carol off, saying that he doesn't do anything like that. Carol suddenly grabs Charlie's hand and pulls it behind his back, ignoring his protests. She puts a bracelet on his hand, saying that it is a device for determining the pollution index. Carol explains that murder, foreign objects, and insults are part of the pollution. Charlie notes that his ability came from a strange book that was stuck in his chest and wonders if it could be of use to him. Suddenly, dark energy begins to pulse in his chest, and Charlie begins to fear that the device will detect it. He notices that Carol has pulled out a gun and begins to fear that she is going to kill him. However, the device signals that no contamination has been detected, and Carol calmly continues to twirl the gun in her hands. Carol explains her behavior by saying that her father taught her to be careful in everything. Charlie decides to change the subject, and says that he recently made some drawings, inviting Carol to look at them. The protagonist's friend sincerely agrees and asks to show her the drawings as soon as possible. After a while, Charlie lies on the bed and admits that the situation was very close to critical. Charlie watches his shadow's progress and notices that its strength and shadow skills are growing rapidly. The main character understands that his shadow spent the whole night training hard. Charlie decides to summon the shadow to thank her for her hard work, as a result of which he became much stronger. Charlie adds that for further progress, you can increase the difficulty, to which the shadow responds with tacit consent. The shadow begins to train hard, performing exercises that are impossible in terms of difficulty. Charlie decides not to stop there and throws up more and more new challenges. Carol comes to the door of Charlie's room and hears his motivational speech. Assuming that Charlie is talking to himself during training, she mentally tells herself that she was worrying about him for nothing. 
Charlie walks down the street the next day, noting that he continues to get stronger without experiencing any pain. The next day, Charlie gave the shadow much more results, and the results were not long in coming. On this day, Uncle Lee, who was left without an arm during one of his military operations, came to visit him. Charlie hopes that through hard training, he can become as strong as all his uncles. After several days of procrastination, Charlie finally decides to train himself and does 10 push-ups. After training, the main character decides to check the shadow statistics and notices that progress has slowed down significantly. Based on the current progress, gaining the required number of points for evolution will be extremely difficult. Charlie suggests that to improve his progress, he may need to move into the dark world and plunges into darkness. A few seconds later, Charlie materializes in his own room, shrouded in a dark aura. Once outside, Charlie decides to walk through the dark world, trying to scout out the situation. Charlie notes that you can only get to the dark side by leaving the real world. Walking through a dark space, Charlie analyzes his surroundings and comes to the conclusion that the dark world looks very similar to the real one. Charlie loses his vigilance and does not notice that the dark whispers around him are thickening more and more, forming into something sinister. Charlie finally hears that there is someone behind him and turns around, assuming that his shadow has come out to meet him. However, turning around, Charlie is met only by a huge mouth with a row of razor-sharp teeth. The shadow monster raises its scythe weapon and prepares to strike. Charlie manages to react and quickly dodges the attack, jumping to the side. Continuing to dodge the monster's attacks, Charlie activates the shadow's pupil and opens a portal to the real world. At the last second before impact, Charlie dives into a shadow portal and disappears into the shadows. Once in the real world, Charlie crashes to the floor, hitting his face on it. The main character admits that he was very scared and wonders what it was. Charlie is glad that the shadow exercises have made him much more mobile, but decides to take revenge on the offender by taking a chair. However, subsequent rematches against the shadow monster are not successful. In one of the fights, he was injured, only miraculously avoiding broken bones. While escaping, Charlie receives a cut wound in the buttocks, which, however, does not prevent him from successfully retreating. After some time, Carol comes to him and helps him regain his strength by treating his wounds. Charlie states that scars adorn a man, to which Carol sarcastically asks whether scars on the buttocks are decoration. Carol argues that if Charlie is in pain now, it means his body will soon get stronger. Charlie asks Carol what her plans are for the rest of the month. Carol doesn't understand what Charlie means by the last month and asks him what he means. Charlie reminds her friend that this is a martial arts exam. Charlie recalls that during the disaster, most industries became less popular, including the cultural and arts industries. Charlie adds that the battles that occupy people's hearts now come first. To become part of the Night Watch, you need to pass a martial arts exam established at the state level. After some thought, Carol admits that she doesn't really want to take this exam. With some hesitation, Carol adds that what she most wants to do is make music. Charlie says that if that's what Carol wants, then he doesn't see any problem, but her father might not approve. Carol expresses confidence that her father will disagree with her wishes. She adds that anyone can now apply to take the martial arts exam. Charlie asks Carol why she is so hesitant, adding that she will definitely pass this exam if she wants. Carol says that the pressure on the night watch is constantly increasing, so almost everyone is taken there. Charlie thinks about the exam, telling himself that he will definitely fail it if there are tests with firearms. An additional frightening factor for Charlie is the possibility of going to some kind of correctional camp if he fails. Charlie asks Carol if he can use her detector, to which Carol asks him in surprise about the reasons why Charlie would need such a thing. Carol adds that her detector is only needed to detect others, and in Charlie's case it would be better for him to run away and call the night watch and wait for rescue. Carol wonders if Charlie's interest is related to his possible plans to take a martial arts exam. Having received an affirmative answer, Carol quickly runs up to Charlie and asks him about the seriousness of his intentions, to which Charlie fussily replies that he also plans to create several comics about the different and special. By randomly blurting out the first thing that came into his head, Charlie arouses Carol's strong interest in comics, so she begins to press him for details. Charlie says that his original idea was to create a story about a skinny guy named Abin who was constantly bullied on campus, but he didn't hold a grudge and had a kind heart. Abin has amazing willpower and is transformed beyond recognition after receiving the super soldier injection. The Night Watch units did not plan to send him to the battlefield, but instead sent him to various events so that he could meet people from high society. Charlie ends the story at the most interesting point, saying that all this happened until the powerful others invaded the city. After some time, Carol brings Charlie to her home, asking him to settle down. Carol asks Charlie to stay here while she goes to her father's room. Charlie discovers a romantic manga about sibling love on Carol's bed and asks her if she likes the genre. Carol is embarrassed and quickly snatches the manga from Charlie's hands, clumsily making an excuse by saying that it is her friend's book, which she has not read. Carol orders Charlie to sit still and not touch her things, then leaves the room. Charlie smiles, sitting on the chair and mentally reflects on the fact that Carol has remained the same and has never learned to defend herself. 
He turns his attention to the guitar, noting that Carol has liked music since childhood, remembering how she used to pester him. Charlie turns on the tape recorder and remembers how Carol spent a lot of time next to him as a child. Unbeknownst to Charlie, Carol returns to the room and asks him about when he started liking music, adding that he used to hate it. After these words, Carol throws virtual reality glasses to Charlie, saying that everything he needs is here. Charlie puts on his glasses and then falls into a bottomless virtual space. Floating in the air, Charlie is surprised to find himself in a virtual version of Shenzhou. According to his recollections, this space was considered the primary source of the cataclysm in which the first others appeared. Charlie notices that some of the monsters were strikingly similar to those he observed in the hospital. Charlie reasons that between our world and Shenzhou's world, there is a space called the Dark World. Based on what Charlie read earlier, the shadow layer is reset every three months, redisplaying the current picture of the world. It is during this period that others penetrate into our world, and since the layer of shadows significantly weakens the world's defenses, people below rank 4 are better off not going out at such moments. Also in the shadow layer, there are many different types of pollution, prolonged contact with which increases the risk of becoming different. Carried away by his research, Charlie does not notice how a huge other appears behind him. However, fortunately for him, a powerful beam of light falls on the monster, dissolving it in a second. Charlie notices that his savior was a humanoid creature, which he easily recognizes as the special one. Charlie notes that the special ones look incredibly cool, hoping to one day be the same. Thinking, Charlie understands that the special is someone else with the body of a person who controls his power, but because of it, he dies. The main character remembers that special people constantly struggle with pollution and alienation, and after their death, there is a high probability of becoming different. That is why, from Charlie's point of view, when specials feel death, they try to deplete themselves as much as possible so as not to turn into a powerful other. Charlie takes off his glasses, very pleased with the images shown. Carol asks Charlie about his impressions, to which he replies that such a large amount of information needs to be digested. Suddenly, Charlie asks Carol if she could stretch his neck, to which she only receives a disgruntled refusal. Charlie offers Carol three original paintings, the content of which she can choose herself. With some reluctance, Carol agrees and begins to stretch Happy Charlie's neck. Carol asks Charlie what's causing his neck pain, to which Charlie says it's because of the training. Carol wonders if Charlie continues to pump up his abs, and having received an offer to touch him, he lifts up the protagonist's t-shirt, touching the rectus muscles. However, the couple is caught by Carol's father, Lou, who has arrived unnoticed. After some time, the heroes silently dine in the kitchen, not daring to start a conversation. Charlie notices that Uncle Lou is looking at him with an undisguised desire to beat him. Carol decides to be the first to break the heavy silence, telling her father that he got it all wrong. Uncle Lou asks Carol what he didn't understand, adding that his eyes are unlikely to deceive him. Finding nothing to answer, Carol knocks on Charlie, demanding at least some sane words from him. Making a serious face, Charlie says that he will drink three glasses as punishment. Assuming that Charlie has something to punish for, Uncle Lou rushes at Charlie, asking his daughter where his knife is. Charlie remembers that Carol and he were childhood friends, although their personalities are completely different. While he was a bully boy, Carol was always a diligent daughter. Charlie suggests that the reason Carol kept hanging around him was because he once protected her from bullies. According to Charlie, she accompanied him on all his adventures, getting into a variety of adventures. However, Uncle Lou never allowed Carol to get too close to Charlie, constantly being wary of him. Uncle Lou looks at Charlie darkly as he takes a cigarette out of his pack and prepares to light it. Carol quickly approaches her father and takes the cigarette with a displeased look. Uncle Lou finally decides to break the dark staring game and asks the heroes what they were doing when he returned. Charlie quickly admits that they were researching information about others and special ones. Having made sure that this is true, Uncle Lou instantly becomes kinder, saying that now he understands everything. He asks Charlie if he knows why the government doesn't let students know about all this in advance. Charlie thinks for a while, after which he honestly admits that he doesn't quite understand the reason. Lou replies that everyone's heart is different, and in sum, evil begins to prevail over kindness and despair can attract creatures from Shenzhou, so there are certain things that everyone should not know about. He adds that not everyone has enough willpower, so if a gap forms in the heart, someone else can penetrate it at any moment. That is why, from the uncle's point of view, various tests are carried out, since only people with appropriate physical training can come into contact with the world of others. However, according to Uncle Lou's observations, even in this case, this world is very dangerous. And even with the current medical abilities of people, it is still out of control. Charlie says that he understood all of Uncle Lou's instructions, but he can't miss the martial arts exam this year. Charlie and Lou's conversation is interrupted by a phone call informing their uncle of an urgent mission concerning the Shadow Lair. Uncle Lou immediately announces that he is moving to the location, telling Charlie that he will take him on the night watch if he passes all his exams well. Charlie puts on a serious face again, answering that uncle can be calm and adding that he and Carol will not do anything forbidden. 
Carol gets angry at Charlie's jokes and stretches his cheeks, screaming that they have never thought of anything like this before. After a while, Charlie goes to the store, summing up the results of his visit to Carol and admitting to himself that he did not learn much new. Walking around the store, Charlie mentally complains that the information he needs will most likely remain classified. Charlie wanders around the store for a while when he suddenly hears his phone ringing. Carol calls Charlie and asks him to buy eggs and a carton of milk, trying to ask him to buy something else, but quickly changes her mind, and without finishing, asks him to forget about it and hangs up. Charlie realizes that she tried to ask him to buy several packs of pads, but was embarrassed and decides to buy them for her anyway. The main character returns home, noting that there is a month left before graduation, upset that the effect of training has begun to wane. Charlie comes to the conclusion that real shadows will have to be added to the training. Charlie watches the moon and feels as if something terrible is about to happen. However, Charlie decides that he hasn't been imagining too much and decides to stretch himself a little. After looking around and making sure that no one is nearby, Charlie opens a portal to the shadow world. Once inside, Charlie immediately hears some strange sounds and notices an approaching strip of life in the distance. A very wounded man appears in front of him and slowly approaches him. Charlie recognizes the exhausted man as a neighbor in the building and asks him why he is there. The neighbor does not give any answers and silently falls to the floor, completely losing his strength. However, behind him, Charlie notices some strange and painfully familiar creature. Taking a closer look, Charlie recognizes the creature as the shadow monster he fought with a few days ago. Charlie clenches his fists and decides it's time to end this once and for all. A few tens of minutes ago, the soldier surrendered his guard, admitting to himself that he was terribly tired. His complaints about life to himself are interrupted by a cry for help coming from a nearby gateway. Having come running to the cry, the soldier discovers two small children who are being sucked into a shadow funnel. The soldier briefly falls into a stupor, not believing that someone else is so openly dragging people into the dark world. The children continue to be pulled deeper and deeper, and they desperately cry out for help. The soldier quickly comes to his senses and jumps towards the children, shouting that he will help them. The soldier manages to grab the children by the hands, but the portal sucks him in with them. He finds himself in a shadowy version of the alley, and the children start crying in fear, looking for their mother. The soldier becomes desperate, saying that he has no weapons and his fighting skills are very weak. However, his monologue is interrupted by a shadow blow flying at him and the children at great speed. Quickly gathering himself, the soldier makes a successful attempt to repel the attack. The soldier notices that the gap has disappeared, which means they will not be able to return back. He mentally notes to himself that there could be others everywhere who will attack at any moment. However, the most terrible factor from his point of view is that there are helpless children here. The soldier understands that all he can do is send a distress signal and wait for rescue. He gives his device to the kids, asking them not to cry, and adding that the device will help counteract the local pollution. The children wipe away their tears and ask him if he can take them home, calling them brother. The soldier replies that he will get them out of here, but they need to stay close to him. Suddenly, a shadow monster hiding in ambush attacks the heroes from around the corner. The soldier recalls that when he was 18, he passed the martial arts exam and entered the martial arts department at the university. According to him, he worked hard from the very beginning and took first place in the alien battle exam. However, this turned out to be not enough, since in the other world, diligence occupied far from the first place. The soldier refused to believe in fate, but no matter how hard he tried, he still could not step over his limit. In the end, all he had to do was move from the faculty to the humanities, becoming an ordinary civilian employee. Returning to the present, the soldier analyzes the shadow, concluding that it has a half-human form and believes it to be of an average level. The shadow rushes to attack, but the soldier manages to dodge and immediately hit it in the side. Having delivered several successful blows to the soldiers, he rejoices, saying that the previously familiar feeling has finally returned. However, because of this, he loses his vigilance and the shadow manages to grab him, pushing him forcefully into the wall. The soldier swears that his body was slower than his mind and notes that he should be more calculating. The shadow continues to press the soldier, delivering dozens of blows, which he barely dodges. The soldier realizes that he won't be able to run forever, so he decides to take a risky step. The soldier flies into the air and uses shadow power, blinding the monster. However, very quickly this force begins to harm him, little by little polluting his soul. He understands that due to his low qualifications, he will not be able to use the powers of the shadow many times, but he does not have much choice. The shadow monster makes a swift dash and delivers a precise blow to the soldier's chest. The soldier flies back and quickly stands up, surprised at how quickly the monster has adapted to his fighting style. He notes that any student from the academy's combat department could cope with it, but for him, it is a great difficulty. However, from the soldier's point of view, he has no right to retreat, so he must bide his time until others pass. One of the attacks, the shadow monster manages to hit the soldier again, piercing his shoulder. Without wasting a second, the shadow monster immediately knocks the soldier to the ground to finish him off. From severe damage, the young fighter's eyes darken, 
and he asks himself whether he is dying. He recalls that at the age of 15, his family was killed by others. So at the age of 18, he decided to take a martial arts test. The shadow monster notices that the soldier is not moving and prepares a powerful finishing attack. Gathering all his will into a fist, the soldier understands that before death, he must give his best, imbuing himself with shadow power. He easily dodges the shadow's numerous strikes as he flies into the air. Taking advantage of the small window of opportunity, the soldier lands a precise kick to the creature's head, stunning it. While the monster is briefly immobilized, the soldier begins to unleash a hail of shadow attacks on the creature's body. However, each blow consumes more and more of the soldier's strength, which is why he begins to slowly weaken. Not having time to finish off the monster, the soldier freezes in place without strength, holding his heavy fist in the air. The shadow counterattacks, knocking the soldier off his feet and sending him flying. The soldier falls to the ground, admitting to himself that he cannot see anything and lamenting that his skills were not enough. The soldier is summing up his life when he suddenly hears some sounds not far from him. The source of the sounds is Charlie, who loudly asks what is going on here. The soldier tries to understand who is standing in front of him, turning over options in his head, but does not recognize Charlie as a member of the Night Watch. Charlie approaches the soldier and tells him to rest and rely on him. The soldier remembers that the exit from the dark side is tightly controlled, so that a random person cannot get here. However, the soldier's thoughts are interrupted by a shadow monster, which delivers a quick fist attack, throwing Charlie far away. He falls into incredible shock, realizing that Charlie is an incredible weakling. Not wanting to mess with Charlie, the shadow monster decides to finish off the soldier, swinging his arms for a quick attack. Luckily, the monster doesn't have time to strike as Charlie slaps him hard, interrupting the attack. Charlie looks at the monster with contempt, telling him to fight him. The monster turns on Charlie and launches a series of rapid attacks, which Charlie successfully avoids. Seizing the moment, he delivers a powerful blow with the bottle, breaking it and forming a rose out of it. The shadow monster attacks Charlie again, but he dodges, quickly moving behind him. Charlie pokes the monster's weak spot with the sharp glass, causing it to writhe in pain. Enraged, the monster begins to furiously attack Charlie, but he easily dodges each of them. Charlie lands several more blows with the broken bottle, forcing the shadow monster to retreat briefly. Charlie decides not to let the monster go, shouting that this time he will not lose and rushes to the attack. The shadow decides to take advantage of Charlie's carelessness and strikes the hero's unprotected body with his tail. After flying into the wall, Charlie scolds himself for his carelessness, telling himself that he shouldn't have attacked the same place. Charlie realizes that the monster cannot be allowed to attack the children, noting that if the monster could just escape, it would have already done so. The main character notes that the shadow has only 20% of its life force left, which means today he will complete the job. The soldier tells Charlie that the monster has a serious injury in its right rib and recommends attacking there. Taking the necessary information to heart, Charlie lunges at the shadow monster with a series of lunges. Charlie begins to distract the monster by quickly moving after a certain number of attempts finding a suitable window for an attack. Hitting the weak spot takes away 2% of the shadow's health and it screams loudly. The shadow takes off again and Charlie assumes that it is going to run away. However, the shadow flies jerkily towards small children in order to devour them and get their blood for restoration. Having reached them, the shadow opens its huge mouth, into which there is some kind of black clot that resembles a tongue. A little boy hugs his girlfriend and looks with horror in his eyes at a row of sharp teeth. Charlie tries to thwart the monster's intentions, realizing that he will not have time to reach him, so he charges himself with energy, preparing to throw. A soda can thrown at a monster at great speed crashes into the monster's head, but he does not pay attention to it. However, at the very last moment, the soldier gathers his remaining strength and delivers a powerful kick to the monster's body. From such a blow, the soldier's vital signs drop by another 3%, and he begins to cough. The shadow becomes furious and decides to eat the weakened soldier instead of the children. However, Charlie manages to reach the monster in time and grabs its face, preventing it from biting either itself or the soldier. Charlie screams at the monster, telling it to die, and sinks his teeth into it forcefully. Continuing to hold the monster in his grip, Charlie knocks him to the ground, striking him. Having gained an advantage over the enemy, Charlie begins to strike multiple blows at the monster. After inflicting enough damage, Charlie again commands the monster to die and delivers a powerful finishing attack. From a powerful blow, the monster shatters into pieces, filling the main character with strength. He barely gets to his feet and notices how objects around him begin to levitate. Charlie takes a deep breath, putting his hand to his forehead and is glad that he finally got his revenge. However, he does not have time to enjoy the triumph, as his eyes begin to darken. Charlie has visions of himself standing at a collection point, surrounded by piles of corpses. Charlie recognizes the place and asks why it has changed so much. Suddenly, dozens of shadow monsters materialize around Charles. Without giving the main character time to come to his senses, the monsters attack him and tear him apart. Charlie wakes up, barely opening his eyes and seeing a soldier in front of him who asks him if he is okay. 
Clearing his throat of the settling dust, Charlie says he's fine. The main character turns around on the head of another, noting that after killing the monster, his memories are cut off. He puts his finger to the head and uses the shadow pupil skill to absorb the essence of the monster. The soldier asks Charlie if he is listening to him, to which he replies that he can hear him. Charlie mentally notes that the soldier is in serious condition and has lost a lot of blood. The soldier invites Charlie to sit next to him against the wall, and they both sit down to rest. The soldier looks at Charlie briefly and asks him if he is a member of the Night Watch. The main character is mentally surprised that the soldier did not recognize him, despite the fact that they live in the same house. Assuming that the soldier has difficulty seeing, Charlie admits that he is not a member of the Night Watch. The soldier chuckles and says that he doesn't believe it, adding that an ordinary person could not cope with someone else of this level. Charlie mentally grumbles about how the soldier is interacting with him despite the fact that he saved his life. The soldier laughs at Charlie for hitting the other soy sauce, saying that it was quite resourceful. Charlie is surprised that the soldier laughs in such a difficult situation, noting that the men on the Night Watch are amazing. The soldier asks Charlie what university he attends and what course he is in. Charlie replies that he is a second-year student, to which the soldier inquires about his department. Without waiting for an answer, the soldier assumes that he is studying at the martial arts department since he is too strong for the humanitarian field. Suddenly, he asks Charlie if he has any cigarettes on him. Charlie says that he only has bikes with him, but the soldier agrees to them. Charlie hands him a piece of the story, saying that the rest were broken during the fight with the monster. After eating the cookies, the soldier asks Charlie if this is the first time he has killed someone else alone, to which the main character gives an affirmative answer. The wounded fighter admits that he has always admired the martial arts department and shares his feelings that his qualifications are much lower. Charlie advises the soldier to talk less to save energy until help arrives. The soldier replies that he is fine, saying that he just wanted to talk to someone. Charlie asks the soldier how he was able to fall into the dark world as an art student and asks him if he regrets everything. The soldier replies that it was his personal choice and he has no regrets. Unable to bear it, he shouts that he is a civilian who goes to work every day and chats with girls, asking if this is a wonderful life. The soldier starts coughing, and the main character again recommends that he calm down. Otherwise, it will be hard for him. The soldier says that he sent out a distress signal a long time ago, expressing confidence that help would be on the way. Charlie gets up and starts to leave, but the soldier grabs his sleeve and advises him not to walk around alone, suggesting they chat a little more. Charlie reluctantly sits down and listens to various stories from the soldier's life about what he used to be like. At the end, he asks Charlie to take something to Director Joe from the Extraordinary Technology Specialty. Charlie says that the soldier will be able to come there himself and tell everyone everything. The soldier says that for a long time he carried everything inside himself and was looking for someone with whom he could chat. The soldier asks Charlie if he still has some chopsticks and asks for a couple of them. Charlie notes that the soldier liked them, grinning slightly. The soldier turns his head towards the sounds from the side and says that the Night Watch seems to have arrived. Charlie says that now he will finally get help and begins to get ready to leave in his own direction. The soldier asks Charlie if he will go with him, to which he replies that he will get home on his own. Exhaling heavily, the soldier smiles at Charlie and wishes him a safe journey. Charlie thanks the soldier and walks away towards the house, after which he turns back. Backup locates the Night's Watch member and approaches to check vital signs. Charlie notices that the wounded fighter's vital signs are beginning to plummet. Charlie begins to teleport, and is surprised that the Night Watch cannot help their ally with the current level of medicine. The fighters decide to salute as a final tribute to the fallen soldier. Charlie tries to reach out and run to the dying soldier, but the crater sucks him in. Charlie again finds himself in a pedestrian crossing surrounded by unsuspecting people. Charlie remembers one of the video briefings of the Night Watch, which says that they should not give up even on the verge of death. According to the rules of the Night Watch, they must take a pill that will increase their power but the chances of death from poisoning reach 90%. Charlie returns home devastated, believing that the soldier actually took the pill that ultimately killed him. The main character understands why the soldier constantly laughed it off and wanted to talk so much. Charlie tells himself that he will always remember him, despite the fact that this soldier passed away so quietly and modestly. He notices his life bar in the mirror, noting that it is quite high despite the fact that he can barely stand. Charlie believes that training just your body is not enough, adding that you will also have to concentrate on willpower. Charlie's thoughts are interrupted by Carol's question about eggs, causing him to drop the food in fear. Carol confronts Charlie about how he isn't answering his calls and isn't home, asking him if he went to the hen house for eggs. Charlie responds with a hastily made-up excuse about being in line for a long time. However, after thinking for a moment, he turns around and asks Carol where she got the keys to his apartment. Carol says Uncle Lee asked her to take care of him since he doesn't cook or order his own food. She examines Charlie, asking him what happened to him, suggesting that he got into a fight. Charlie clumsily responds to Carol, saying she has to go home or else her father will get it all wrong again. However, Carol does not pay attention to his words and grabs his clothes, demanding that he turn around. 
Carol notices that Charlie's clothes are badly torn in places and asks him excitedly and loudly where he got so hurt. Charlie tries to break free, asking Carol to let him go, to which she demands answers. The main character again comes up with a fictitious story, saying that on the way home, he was attacked and robbed, but he caught up with the offender and beat him, after which he went home. Charlie brags, saying he has incredible reflexes when boxing with air. Noticing the bruises on Charlie's face, Carol touches his cheeks with her hand, gently running her fingers over him. Charlie freezes in place, letting Carol examine him, admitting to himself that she will never believe his bullshit. After a short pause, Carol asks the main character if he is in pain. Charlie gets a little embarrassed and says he's fine and just wants to sleep. Carol quickly leaves him and says that he needs to tell Uncle Lee about everything, because it's no good to fight at night. Charlie grabs Carol's hand and says that he was just standing up for himself, asking her not to tell her uncle anything. Charlie theatrically falls to the floor, saying that he is too weak to go any further. Carol says that Charlie needs to go to the hospital, to which he shirks, saying that he has everything he needs at home. Carol irritably asks Charlie if he expects her to give him medicine, to which he smiles and asks him to patch him up. Carol bandages all of Charlie's wounds without unnecessary tenderness, causing him to scream in irritation. Carol hits Charlie on the shoulder and asks him if he will do this again, to which he promises that this will not happen again. Carol asks Charlie to swear, but he replies that he cannot promise such a thing, because the desire to fight is inherent in men by nature. Carol begins to hit Charlie lightly, and he promises that he will no longer get into fights himself. Carol finishes the bandage and says she's leaving, to which Charlie invites her to stay, adding that he has a very large bed. Carol turns towards Charlie and sticks her tongue out at him before leaving the apartment. Left alone with himself, Charlie remembers the soldier's request for a message to Beta. Suddenly, Charlie jumps out of bed, remembering that he didn't even know his ally's name. After some time, Charlie decides to look up information about the other one he recently destroyed. Charlie wonders if the first person killed will be displayed by someone else, or if he will be consumed by the shadow's bite before the kill is registered. Charlie notices that as a reward, he received the skill of Sneaky Strike, which is a hidden attack from the shadows that the enemy cannot see. Charlie decides to try out the skills he has learned and stands in the center of the room, saying the name of the skill. Nothing happens and Charlie suspects something is wrong with the system. Charlie thinks about it and assumes that the problem is that there is no target for the attack. Charlie decides to explore himself and looks at his options, which reveal that he is a stalker who is at home in the shadows. Charlie wonders why everything is written in such convoluted language, wondering what he should do if he is in the light. The system informs Charlie that his shadow has undergone dramatic changes, and now he can fully control it and merge with it. The system message says that when training in a new form, the effect of training will be significant, which delights the main character. Charlie is also informed that in case of serious injuries, his blood volume will be delayed, which will slow down his measurement. So Charlie says that it is better to die happy. Having finished learning the new features, Charlie decides to summon a shadow to test everything in practice. A few seconds later, the shadow crawls out of the floor and freezes, awaiting his commands. Charlie decides to try touching the shadow and sticks his finger out, slowly moving closer. Touching the shadow, he begins to slowly merge with it, watching as darkness envelops his skin. Having completely merged with the shadow, Charlie decides to test the capabilities of the new form. Charlie begins to rush around at breakneck speed, turning into a shapeless clot of shadow energy. After testing his speed, Charlie decides to train his strength and lifts his bed with ease. Delighted with his new powers, Charlie says out loud that he is now invincible. Charlie is pleased to note that the shape of the shadow is not striking, but it justifies itself perfectly. The system suggests that Charlie take the stalker skill, warning that no one else has it, adding that this has its own risks. Charlie thinks about the offer, deciding that the opportunity may be worth the risk. However, suddenly a shadow creeps out of the system window, preventing Charlie from making up his mind. The shadow envelops Charlie, sucking him into a shadow cocoon and interacting with his power. After the metamorphosis ends, the system informs Charlie that he is now a killer, adding that if he does not kill, he will die himself. The system warns that his attacks can now damage even a god, but he will not be freed from the need to kill. The next system screen states that once shadow form is activated, his killing ability will be greatly increased. The system also adds that he can now activate the decapitation skill, which depends on the blood level, strength, abilities, and other factors of both parties. Charlie guesses that this is the skill that activated the last time he killed the shadow monster. The main character again rejoices at his newly acquired powers and hopes that he is now invincible. Charlie suddenly feels relieved and checks his wounds, noticing that he is completely healed. The protagonist suggests that activating the shadow form greatly enhances the power of regeneration. The next morning, Carol's classmates notice a photo of Charlie on social media. One of Carol's friends says that she heard that yesterday Charlie met some merchant and fought with him, but he had a knife. Carol tells her classmates not to fall for these stories, adding that a dog was chasing him. After some time, Carol and two classmates come to Charlie's apartment. 
Suddenly, one of Carol's friends asks Carol where she got the key to Charlie's house, confusing her. After answering the question evasively, Carol enters the apartment, saying that she came to visit him with her friends. Charlie sits in the center of the room and checks his wound, which has suddenly opened. Carol flies up to the main character, asking him if he still has bandages. Carol's friends approach Charlie and excitedly touch his new muscles. Carol quickly puts a stop to this act of generosity by telling her friends to get into the living room. Carol's friends hear screams from the room and ask each other if Charlie will be okay. Carol treats Charlie's wound, saying that she knows this ointment, adding that it doesn't hurt at all. She adds that Charlie's wound needs to be treated very well, but the main character is too busy looking at her legs. Carol tells Charlie that he fights too much, to which he replies that he will be fine. Carol asks him what he did yesterday, asking him not to make up any nonsense but to be honest. Charlie replies that he just committed an act of knightly justice, to which Carol tells him that he is definitely lying. Charlie asks Carol what time Uncle Lou returned yesterday, to which she replies that he did not return. The main character says that it seems to him that the night watch works quite cruelly, adding that they have almost no free time to recover. Carol doesn't say anything, and Charlie realizes that she is very worried about her father. The main character realized that most of the night watch employees put their lives in danger every day, and Uncle Lee was left without an arm, and the soldier, whose name was Linmo, died at the age of 20. Carol asks Charlie if he will go to work on the night watch if he passes the martial arts exam. Charlie thinks about the offer for a few seconds, and then asks Carol if there will be beauties there. Carol doesn't appreciate Charlie's joke and pulls his cheek, telling him to shut his mouth. Carol's friends eavesdrop on their conversations and squabbles, standing outside the door. The guy asks the girl what's going on, to which she replies that everything is obvious. After a while, when the sounds of the fight die down, the friends enter the room and ask Charlie how he is feeling. Charlie sits on the sofa, saying that he is fine and invites the guests to sit down. The guests sit down next to him, and Charlie begins to tell them a made-up story about his adventures. Carol tells Charlie that she is going to the store and takes his torn jacket, saying that she will throw it away. Charlie doesn't mind, and continues to tell his guests his fascinating stories. Suddenly, Charlie remembers that there are things left in the jacket and jumps towards Carol, asking her to wait a little. Carol turns to him and a package of feminine pads falls out of his jacket. Carol makes a face and asks Charlie why he might need it. Charlie replies that Carol had a stomach ache yesterday, so he wanted to please her when he returned from the store. Friends watch the unfolding events with interest, taking out their phones. Charlie picks up the package and gives it to Carol, saying that if anything happens, she can contact him. Carol blushes and yells at Charlie that he shouldn't have done that before throwing the package at him. Charlie rubs his forehead where the packaging hit him and doesn't understand why Carol is so angry. After some time, Carol and friends leave, leaving Charlie alone. Charlie immediately uses the shadow pupil skill, creating a portal to the shadow world. While the portal is charging, Charlie returns to his shadow form, deciding to train. After some time, Charlie is smoothly transported to the other side, into the shadow world. Suddenly, Charlie feels very comfortable here. This feeling reminds the main character of finding himself in pure nature after a long time in a polluted city. Charlie also notes that his stomach has stopped hurting and his blood volume has increased significantly. Charlie decides to start training and tries to jump, but flies up several meters without calculating the strength. Charlie feels overwhelmed with endless energy and decides to continue training. He performs challenging exercises like push-ups with effortless ease. Suddenly, the system informs Charlie that if he has activated the shadow bite, which only absorbs the darkness from the shadow layer, the system also adds that during the classes, his physical condition became incredibly stronger. Charlie decides his room is too small for space, so he'll practice outside. Charlie decides to try exercises on horizontal bars and easily performs the most difficult exercises. Meanwhile, another meeting begins at the Night Watch headquarters. The speaker reports that according to reports, unrest in the Shadow City has become more frequent and unpredictable. The speaker continues by saying that Night Watch units have discovered gaps in the northern, southern, and eastern districts. Another participant in the meeting comments on the information, saying that on the map, the areas of pollution cover mainly residential areas. Uncle Lou is present at the meeting, who mentally notes that recently others have begun to appear much more often. He recalls that in the past two days, there have been four incidents where people were dragged into the Shadow City. Although this seems like a small number, Uncle Lou has no idea when the others will attack next. From his point of view compared to the Shadow Layer anomaly, the breaches pose a much greater threat. Lou realizes that someone else in the shadow layer may be like Godzilla, who has eaten too much steroids. Uncle Lee tells the council that these are just suspicions, so they shouldn't act like they've already lost. He also asks everyone present if they are really not ready for battle. The council and Uncle Lou do not answer this question, and he asks the others to continue. Uncle Lou takes out a pack of cigarettes, taking one of them between his teeth and reaching for his lighter. Suddenly he finds himself holding cookies in his mouth, which Carol replaced with cigarettes. Uncle Lee decides to help out his friend and throws him his pack, which he easily catches. However, Lou does not take the cigarettes from there and tells Uncle Lee that he is afraid of lung cancer. 
Uncle Lee chuckles at Lou's words and doesn't really believe him, but quickly switches the topic to something more important. After some time, Uncle Lou asks Lee if this is indeed confirmed information, to which he asks him to check his laptop. Lou opens the computer and a message flashes up telling him that all Rank 2 specials must submit their children's applications for admission after they pass the exam. Lou asks Lee what department he's thinking of sending Charlie to. Lee says that he would be much better off doing ordinary crafts rather than going into martial arts or humanities. Lou asks him what will happen if Charlie passes the exam with flying colors. Lee takes one last breath and leaves the room, giving a rather evasive answer. Lou asks him to express himself more clearly, looking after him, to which he recommends that he conscientiously fulfill his duties. A girl enters the room and says that a few minutes ago they received a message from the Shadow Layer. A new report on the others reveals a strange other that appears to be a strange shadow. The creature is described as having a humanoid shape and was first discovered in the Chin Theater Garden. The report also says that the shadow is constantly engaged in sports, and when the detectors approach, it stops training and salutes. The girl adds that the observer discovered a strange other about whom there is no information in the databases. Lou studies the report of the Night Watch and wonders what kind of other person this is. Meanwhile, in the shadow layer, Charlie comes across a spider monster and says that it contains a lot of protein. Charlie films everything on his phone and continues to say that spider meat is very healthy and juicy. Charlie is happy that his video about the shadow layer is liked by so many people and hopes that it will become popular very soon. Charlie decides to start a live broadcast about the others and watches how many people come to the stream. Charlie's joy is interrupted by a sudden notification from the system that almost causes him to drop his phone. The notice states that if he does not act first, he will die, adding that only after a series of constant killings will he be able to continue his quiet life. Charlie is angry that the system decided to scare him and jumped out at the most unexpected moment. However, despite his irritation, he notices that the system gives him 100 hours to commit the murder of another. Charlie goes into shock, unable to believe that his own life could end in 100 hours. The 100-hour deadline echoes in Charlie's head, and he freezes in place, trying to accept what's happening. Charlie remembers the description of the skill, understanding the risks involved, concluding that he is in trouble. Charlie calms himself down, saying that he should not worry, but urgently come up with some kind of plan. Charlie rereads the description of his ability and believes that he needs to fulfill the position of a hunter and hunts. Charlie concludes that he can live while he kills others and perhaps even gain immortality. The system adds that immortality may consist not only in the inability to die, but also in the transition of the soul to a new body at death, which confuses Charlie. Charlie is skeptical of the system's suggestion that he enjoy killing, saying that he cannot enjoy it. Collecting his thoughts, he looks around the corner and watches the spider, mentally telling himself that he needs to kill the spider to earn himself hit points. Charlie puts the phone next to the pot and props it up with a pebble, deciding to record the fight with the spider on camera. After he completes the broadcast preparations, he summons his shadow form with a wave of his hand. Charlie talks quietly to the viewers of his broadcast, carefully approaching the sleeping spider from behind and swinging a bat. Charlie notes that he can't wait to use the steel he spent several thousand yuan on. Charlie strikes several times, causing the spider to instantly wake up and turn around. Charlie realizes that, in shadow form, he is almost impossible to notice, so he decides to find out about the monster's weak points. Having walked around the spider, he notices a significant point of vulnerability in the area of its sting and prepares to strike. Half an hour before Charlie appeared, the spider was calmly nesting on the street, rejoicing that the environment here was very comfortable. According to the spider, there is no depressing atmosphere here, and she just needs to be careful to live a comfortable life. Spider notes that he recently had to fight some ugly guy, noting that despite minor injuries, he received a full meal. The monster decides to get some sleep to fully restore his strength. Suddenly, the monster's spider sense tells him that someone is watching him closely. The spider jumps up and looks around, trying to figure out who is watching him. Not finding anyone with its eyes, the spider tells itself that this place still seems unsafe, therefore, but will spend the night in another place. Unexpectedly for the spider, severe pain pierces him in the area of the sting, piercing his body with discharges of shadow lightning. Charlie stands behind the monster and notes that he felt the shadow flowing out of him like a river, believing that if he found one more weak point, he could release all of his power. Charlie tries to remove the bat from the spider's wound, grateful that there's only 40% blood left. However, the spider quickly fires a beam of red energy at the arrogant Charlie, throwing him into the wall. Having cleared the dust, Charlie consoles himself with the fact that such a blow does not hurt him at all. The spider spins around in rage and tries to find the offender, and Charlie realizes that he still does not see him. Otherwise, the hit was accidental. Charlie gets to his feet and decides to use a shadow attack, diving underground as if into water. Charlie watches the spider from below, admiring how cool it feels to attack from the shadows. The main character tells himself that there is no need to fight another person face to face if he can wait for the right moment to strike a fatal blow. 
The spider continues to spin around, causing the bat stuck in it to cause minor bleeding damage. After waiting for the right moment, Charlie decides that it is time for the final blow. Meanwhile, on the streaming platform, the viewer decides to watch different bloggers who talk about a variety of things. Behind the stream about how things work differently, there are streams about travel, social experiments, and a bunch of other areas. The viewer is a bored, white-haired girl who switches channels in search of the right one. Suddenly, the girl stumbles upon the stream of Charlie, who took the pseudonym Yo. The girl watches the stream with interest, terribly interested in the real show of battles with others. Charlie continues to broadcast, saying that he is fighting a spider, which is an ancient species of rank one ghost. The girl is angry that Yo's viewers are skeptical of his videos, telling herself that she can't stand such behavior. The girl quickly enters the chat and writes to Yo about what she can help him with in his case. Suddenly, the stream shows Charlie crawling out of the shadow next to the spider. The girl is surprised by this turn, guessing that the broadcast is also being conducted by someone else. She puts down the phone contentedly and decides to stay on the stream, saying that everything is getting much more interesting. Charlie leaps out of the shadows and flies into the air above the unsuspecting spider. However, the spider manages to hear the whistle from Charlie's impending blow and, turning around, meets him with a blow from the sting. The sting, like a knife through butter, pierces the surface and causes strong smoke from fragments of stones. However, as soon as the smoke clears, the spider discovers that no one is at the impact site. Someone pokes a finger at the spider on the other side, and it turns back, trying to figure out what's going on. Charlie, meanwhile, continues to film himself, mocking the uncomprehending monster. Charlie continues to dodge more and more of the spider's attacks, only teasing him back. The girl admires Yu's speed, saying that he is incredibly handsome and fast. The spider decides to switch to another tactic and spews out a stream of purple acid. The acid forms a small puddle around him, making undetected approaches from the ground impossible. Charlie asks the spider if he really thinks that he won't be able to do anything if the ground is covered in acid. Charlie climbs onto a building near the spider and lights up with blue fire, revealing his location to the monster. Having prepared for the attack, Charlie turns into a shadow clot and quickly flies through the building towards the spider. The spider again shoots streams of acid from itself, covering the building that Charlie flies through. However, Charlie easily teleports to another shadow, mentally saying that he can pass through buildings as long as he needs. Charlie makes a series of shadow dashes, taking the bat from the spider's body and appearing directly below it. Giving the monster no time, Charlie stabs it through the head with a bat, killing it in one blow. Moving away from the lifeless body, Charlie uses the shadow bite skill, absorbing the powers of the defeated spider. Having absorbed all the enemy's forces, Charlie says that his hunt is over for the day. The girl admits that it was an incredibly exciting sight, the likes of which she had not seen for a long time. The girl decides to establish contact with blogger Yo and writes him a message asking him to take him with her on a mission. Charlie studies the spider, looking at its characteristics and features. Finding out that spiders are rather weak opponents, Charlie sighs in disappointment, saying that he hoped he had defeated a strong enemy. Charlie notes that there was a large power gap between him and this other, but he took advantage of the shadow attack. Charlie ends the broadcast, happy that he had a whopping 150 viewers. The protagonist takes a second look at the abilities he has acquired and decides to try the shadow network skill. Concentrating, Charlie shoots a black substance shaped like a spider's rope into the building. Charlie pulls himself up on a makeshift rope and shouts joyfully that he succeeded. However, having lost his head from his successes, he does not have time to react in time and crashes face first into the wall. Charlie falls down and lands on the lantern, telling himself that he'll have to practice this skill more. Charlie checks his statuses in the system and notices that his lifespan is now seven days, upset by such an insignificant increase. Charlie says that even though he has a week to spare, it's not so easy to find others, so it's better to be on the safe side. Charlie accesses the system again and unlocks the mark skill, which allows you to mark the selected target. The system notifies Charlie that the effect of the mark will last only one second for a single target, but this time will increase if the reputation increases. This ability will also reveal Charlie's location, which means he will have to use this skill with extreme caution. When hunting a marked target, the hunter's speed and agility increases, and upon successful completion of the hunt, one of the skills will be permanently enhanced. Charlie wonders when he got his reputation, but quickly realizes that it was a live broadcast. A cunning plan immediately matures in Charlie's head, and he decides to hunt others, gaining subscribers, which will make his reputation go uphill. Charlie jumps to the ground and decides that he still has a lot to do today, so he needs to try hard. Charlie quickly finds another one, who, however, is superior in size and strength to the previous opponent. Having marked the target, Charlie rushes down with confidence, wanting to make a stealthy attack on the monster. After some time, Carol again heals the wounds that Charlie received in the last fight while listening to his cries about how much pain he was in. The girl asks the main character who he fought with this time. Charlie tells Carol to calm down because he's going to be a hero, adding that she won't understand that. 
Carol is not impressed by Charlie's pretentious speeches and asks him about how many heroes whine every day about being hurt. Carol advises Charlie not to go anywhere unless he has the right skills, but he quietly mumbles that he could heal his wounds in a matter of seconds with the help of the shadow form, adding that he does not turn it on at all so that it will help him. Carol asks Charlie what he is saying now. Charlie quickly comes to his senses and abruptly changes the topic, asking her to watch a movie. Carol says there's not much to watch right now, adding that a blogger recently came along that has piqued everyone's interest. Carol approaches Charlie and shows him the phone, which is playing a recording of his own broadcast. In surprise, Charlie spits out the water he was drinking and coughs violently. Carol backs away from Charlie a little and asks him what caused such a violent reaction. Charlie brushes it off with generalities, after which he asks his lover how often she watches this blogger. Carol moves closer to Charlie again, saying that she's been watching this blogger for two days, saying that this blogger has become the most popular and unusual. Charlie is worried that such a rapid increase in popularity could attract the attention of the Night Watch and asks Carol whether publishing others is a crime. Carol notes that it's really not worth disclosing your knowledge about them. However, from her point of view, blogger yo shows do not affect people's consciousness, so she does not see this as an offense. The girl moves even closer to Charlie to better show him the video and says that she wants to follow the example of this blogger who fights so well with others. She also points out to Charlie that one of the bloggers has already done an analysis of Yo's video. Charlie smiles and sits quietly, admiring how interested Carol is. After finishing watching the video, Carol asks Charlie if she too can become so famous someday. Charlie asks Carol what she will do, additionally asking if she plans to wear a white silk dress and dance in the shadow layer. Carol is embarrassed and says that she was thinking about making some videos about others, to which Charlie remarks that it might be too informative. He also says that if Carol goes out in such an outfit, her fans will start following her and nothing good will come of it. Carol's face changes and begins to suspect something, after which she asks what he means by these words. Suddenly, she comes behind Charlie and takes out a gun, pointing it to the protagonist's back. Carol irritably asks Charlie if he got his injuries while he was also tracking someone. Charlie quickly throws his hands up and loudly admits that he was only joking. Carol asks him how she knows he's not lying, to which Charlie begs Carol to let him go, calling him an officer. After Carol leaves, Charlie decides to take a break and plops down on the couch, pulling out his phone. Charlie checks his personal messages, in which he is bombarded with skeptical assumptions that all his videos are fakes. The main character does not understand this attitude towards him, puzzling over the reason why he is considered a fraudster. He clicks on one of the links in the messages and goes to a video in which a user named Earth Dao says he will take down the scammer. The earthly Tao describes Charlie in a mocking manner, saying that this is not real. As the first evidence, Earthly Gift cites the fact that several frames in his video do not have a smooth transition, which indicates an editing splice. The blogger also pays attention to the background, suggesting that it is also a superimposed special effect. Charlie says that Earth Tao was an ordinary food blogger and doesn't understand why he suddenly decided to expose him. Earth Tao says that he is a freelance member of the Night Watch, so he can easily recognize a fake. Charlie opens the comments and notices that some viewers agree with the Earthly Tao and says that someday these fools will know the whole truth. Charlie decides to start hunting for other aliens, but first of all, he needs to teach the Earthly Tao a lesson. The main character again uses the shadow pupil, and with renewed vigor, he jumps into the shadow layer. This time, Charlie attaches a mini camera to his shoulder to make the shooting more natural. Charlie observes the city, noting that today the number of others is much lower, remembering that the shadow layer is reset from time to time. After a long search, Charlie finally spots another sixth rank and decides it's time to start hunting. Taking out a bat enhanced by shadow powers, he tells himself that he is very interested in what another of the sixth rank is capable of. Charlie runs to the edge of the building to fall like a stone directly on someone else, but does not find him below. Frustrated by this state of affairs, Charlie quickly goes down the stairs. Going down, he finally stumbles upon another, who is also looking around in search of victims. Concentrating, Charlie casts a marking spell on his unsuspecting opponent. After placing the mark, the other immediately senses Charlie's presence and his heartbeat increases significantly. Charlie notes that the other is overcome by an inexplicable fear, and he begins to look around in search of Charlie. Also, the main character finds some similarities in this other and the monster with whom he fought at the very beginning of his journey. However, now, according to Charlie, he himself has evolved and will fight much better than then. Charlie charges, impaling the monster with his bat using the six-strike technique. Another suffers severe damage that reduces his life force to 45% and emits a high-pitched scream of pain. The other flies into the air and Charlie rushes after him, reactivating the tag and the chase effects. Charlie delivers a crushing blow, but the creature easily dodges, making rapid dashes in the air. The monster decides to launch a quick counterattack, going behind Charlie's back, but he quickly jumps to the side, pushing off the wall with his feet. Upon landing, Charlie swings his bat to make a quick dash towards his opponent. However, another opens its mouth and uses its tentacles to accumulate psionic energy. 
From the mental attack, Charlie loses initiative and begins to feel very dizzy. Without waiting for Charlie to come to his senses, the monster attacks using its powers, delivering several psionic blows to his body. Charlie rises to his feet after being hit and notices that his blood count has dropped by 34% in just one hit. The main character decides to change his strategy, otherwise things will end very badly for him. The monster continues to attack Charlie with its blades, but he dodges, diving into the shadows. Having cornered the shadow, the monster strikes multiple times close to it to prevent Charlie's maneuvers. However, Charlie suddenly disappears from sight and appears on top of the monster, preparing for a series of powerful blows. Charlie goes into super speed, delivering dozens of blows per second, continuing to move elusively around the monster. In response to the monster's feeble attempt to escape, Charlie delivers a powerful elbow strike that knocks him to the ground. Charlie runs up to the other and prepares to use decapitation to finish off the monster once and for all. However, suddenly the other's face partially dissolves, and Charlie sees the same soldier named Lin Mo, with whom he fought against his first other. Charlie stops and doesn't understand why Lin Mo became like this and how he ended up here. The other throws Charlie away with a blast of dark energy and escapes the grip. Taking advantage of the moment, the monster immediately starts running away, without giving Charlie any answers. Charlie gives chase, asking the monster to stop, but stops a few minutes later, completely losing sight of the monster. The system tells Charlie that the hunt was almost a success, but at the last moment everything did not go according to plan. She adds that continued failure will shorten his lifespan and weaken him. The system tells Charlie that if hunting is not his life, then his life will turn into a slow wait for death. Charlie angrily hits the system screen, which keeps repeating the same phrase over and over again. Charlie thinks about what a hero ultimately becomes who sacrifices himself to save others. He wonders to himself whether he too will turn into a monster when he dies. However, realizing that there is no turning back for him, Charlie decides to continue the hunt. Charlie arrives in Eastern District Number 1, which is one of the gathering places. The main character uses the shadow's pupil and creates a portal to the roof of the building to better see the situation. Charlie feels that there are many more others here, but apparently they are unlikely to leave the building. However, turning around, he notices that there is another large one on the roof of a neighboring building. Charlie also notices that his leg is seriously damaged, which could give him a great advantage in a fight with this creature. Charlie tries to sneak up behind the other, carefully crawling out of the shadows, but the monster hears his actions. The monster turns around sharply, but Charlie manages to quickly slip back into the shadows. Charlie notices the red dots on the monster's body, believing that they are why he is so sensitive and decides to calm his target. Charlie waits patiently for the monster to let his guard down again and finally finds a window of opportunity. Appearing above the monster, he reactivates the mark and boldly rushes into battle. Meanwhile, Carol stands in the kitchen of Charlie's apartment and without turning around at the sound of the front door closing, asks him where he has been. She turns around and sees that Uncle Lee and Lou have arrived at the apartment, the latter of whom notices that she's cooking for Charlie again, little by little muttering about how, apparently, he was raising his daughter for him. Carol becomes embarrassed and turns away, telling her father that he is talking nonsense again. The girl asks her uncles why they returned so early, to which they answer that they finished early at the office, so they were lucky to get together. Carol's father suggests they all go to the restaurant, but Carol says there is no need since she is almost finished cooking. Uncle Lee sits down at the table and says that they can go another day, after which he invites the others to sit at the table too. Lee asks where Charlie is now, to which Carol assumes that he went out for a walk and will be back soon. Uncle Lee is outraged that Charlie has gone out to have fun, leaving Carol alone, when suddenly the front door opens again. Charlie enters the apartment, saying that he is madly hungry, and turns to Carol, saying that the apartment smells delicious from her cooking. Charlie turns around and says that he's in a good mood today, so he bought her favorite candy, adding that he saw how many messages she sent him and asks her if she misses him. Carol and the uncles greet this performance with significant silence and awkward glances. Charlie quickly puts on the face of the most innocent person on earth and says that he was attacked by a dog on the way, which is why he was so late. Uncle Lee says that they rarely get a moment to get together, so Charlie should not ruin the fun and just sit down at the table. After Charlie sits down at the table, Charlie pats him on the shoulder and tells him that it's okay to fight a lot as a guy. Uncle Lou adds that he also doesn't see anything wrong with showing off to the girl he likes during his youth. Uncle Lee says that he recently saw Lou with some girl and asks her about her, to which Uncle Lou vividly describes the merits of his girlfriend, saying that he would give everything for such a girl if he were young. Uncle Lou raises his glass, offering to drink to the success of everyone present. Charlie notices that Carol is blushing when her father talks about his girlfriend and smiles slyly. Charlie proposes the next toast to Uncle Lou in particular, knowing in his mind that these two will most likely leave him a wet spot. Charlie also adds that Uncle Lou should eat more vegetables, since he is away from home all day and rarely gets to eat Carol's cooking. Charlie says he's sure Carol cooks at home often because her skills are top-notch. 
Uncle Lou reflects in his mind that Carol seems to be putting a lot of effort into taking care of Charlie, since he himself is constantly eating takeout. After some time, Carol and Uncle Lou say goodbye to Charlie and Uncle Lee and go home. Left alone, Charlie first offers Uncle Lee a drink of water, but he refuses. Suddenly, Uncle Lee tells Charlie that he wanted to ask him something important. Lee stares at Charlie and asks him what he thinks he has. Uncle Lee says that he has been serving on the Night Watch for 20 years, and it costs him nothing to recognize Charlie's injuries, and then asks him about when his abilities appeared. Charlie sits on the sofa next to his uncle and says that his abilities manifested themselves half a month ago. Uncle Lee asks him how they manifested themselves and asks him not to worry, but to simply answer. Charlie says that he himself did not really understand how they appeared, since it was too sudden. Uncle Lee is surprised, saying that this kind of situation happens extremely rarely. Charlie makes the assumption that all this is due to his exceptional talents. Uncle Lee greets this act of extraordinary modesty with knowing silence and places his hand on Charlie's shoulder. Uncle says that this year there will be a test and everyone must pass the martial arts exam. Charlie says that both he and Carol know about it, while Uncle Lee decides to get a cigarette. He says that in recent years, the Night Watch unit has come under intense pressure and the number of victims is constantly growing. Lee tells Charlie that he can offer him a backup plan in case he fails the martial arts exam. He says that Charlie can choose from several schools to attend, adding that if Charlie likes comics, he can choose the art department or any other. Charlie asks Uncle Lee if he can just take away his diploma and not go anywhere. Lee slaps Charlie in the face and says that he might not even dream of such a thing. He says that Charlie should go to Lindong University, after which he can get a stable job and live happily with Carol. Charlie scratches his head and tells his uncle that this is not what he wants. According to him, he would really like to try to become a special member of the Night Watch. Uncle Lee yells at Charlie, saying that he should listen to him and not argue with him. Charlie says that if Uncle Lee doesn't allow him, he will go to the Night Watch and pawn him. Uncle Lee says that the special world is more dangerous than anything he has ever seen, again suggesting that he study calmly and not worry. Charlie says he's serious too, adding that there are dangers everywhere and Uncle Lee won't be able to protect him forever. Uncle Lee tells Charlie that he will most likely regret his decision, but if he thinks about transferring, he can contact him at any time. Charlie asks Uncle Lee not to put a spoke in his wheels, to which he just shrugs it off and says goodbye to him. Charlie tells his uncle that, based on the information he looked at from Carol before dying, Special people must use all their powers before dying so as not to turn into a monster. Charlie wonders if there is a possibility that a person will become different, even if he has exhausted his powers, to which he receives an affirmative answer. Uncle Lee asks Charlie why he is asking, to which he replies that it is all out of sporting interest. Lee says that if he chooses martial arts, sooner or later he will face it anyway, so he better take a break and stop fighting. He adds that this year's challenge will take place before the new year, so if he wants to win, he will need to prepare. Uncle Lee leaves, leaving Charlie alone with his thoughts. Charlie sits on the sofa and thinks about the reasons why Lin Mo turned into another. He remembers that the Night Watch is supposed to take all people from the battlefield, regardless of their abilities. Charlie does not exclude the possibility that he was mistaken, and the other person he fought with had the ability to cause hallucinations. Charlie's viewer goes to his blog and sees a new video there, which makes him very happy. Moving on to the comments, she finds that the number of haters and skeptics has increased significantly. She sits down comfortably and begins sending her angry replies to everyone who disagrees. After she sends her opinion to everyone, the girl tells herself that blogger Ye is definitely not a liar. She turns on the video and enjoys the complete immersion provided by the mini camera attached to Charlie's body. Charlie jumps down from the roof of a building, causing the girl to be afraid that he is about to fall to his death. However, several tens of meters from the ground, Charlie uses a shadow net and begins to swing on it, causing delight among his fan. Suddenly, a beam of otherworldly energy hits Charlie knocking him down and knocking him to the ground. Another approaches Charlie and puts his paw on him to prevent him from escaping. This time, Charlie again fights with a large other, who is a rather serious opponent. However, Charlie breaks free from the grip, flying up and knocking over the other with the help of a shadow net. The girl looks at Charlie's shadow form and says that he is incredibly handsome. She continues to watch Charlie fight the huge monster with undisguised admiration. The girl notes that it all looks too natural, and there can be no mistake in plausibility here. In her opinion, Charlie is indeed the real killer of others from Beidou. Charlie uses Shadow Bite on a downed opponent to absorb their essence. The girl assumes that Charlie is doing this to gain additional abilities. She remembers that it was exactly the same before when he fought the giant spider. Sometime later, Charlie returns home and examines his wounds in the mirror. Charlie says that the others in the area are very strong, noting that if they weren't injured, he wouldn't be able to survive. Charlie opens his phone and again finds himself on a video of the earthly Tao, in which he again analyzes the video of blogger Yo. He reviews the new video, saying that the other one Charlie fought was wounded and very weak, adding that even an ordinary person can handle such things. In Dao's opinion, the special one would not pay attention to such weaklings. 
Charlie admits that the fight was not very spectacular, but these videos still make him very angry. In Charlie's opinion, his current strength is still not enough for anything more. Charlie decides that he must become so strong that no one will dare to doubt him. Charlie brings up the system window and looks at his data, which says he looks strong but is actually weak. Charlie is angry at the notice, saying that he could give both his uncles and Carol a head start in terms of strength. However, he does not argue that his current abilities are not enough and he will need to become even stronger. Charlie notes that his shadow points are not indicators of experience, as he previously thought, but rather reflect his energy reserves. He estimates that using the shadow thread or shadow pupil requires about three glasses. According to his further calculations, the mark and the chase have different degrees of consumption and the shadow form depends on the environment. Charlie sums up his thoughts by saying that the specials are very strong and he can only fight them in his shadow form, adding that even in this state, he is unlikely to last long. However, the main character does not give up and believes that even this will be enough to at least intimidate them. Charlie tells himself that restraint is not his thing, so he will give it his all. Sometime later, Charlie goes shopping with Carol and her friends. He shouts at the girls that they are liars, adding that they promised that this would not last longer than an hour. Charlie tells himself that if he continues to waste his life like this, he won't last even a few days, to which Carol's friend replies that it's better not to joke about it. Charlie says he's not kidding, explaining that if he doesn't kill, he'll die. His interlocutor asks him what he means, to which he brushes it off, saying that the girls have finally returned. Carol suggests going to a cafe and the group of friends head to the appropriate section, not noticing the presence of a dark entity behind them. Charlie takes the girls to the best cafe in his opinion, and Carol studies the menu, which, among other things, serves steamed bull genitals. Charlie laughs it off and says that he recently got injured, so he orders several dishes at once. Carol, gritting her teeth, is surprised that Charlie chose so many normal dishes and did not even stop at choosing any exotic ones. Charlie agrees with Carol's conclusions, saying that the dishes are indeed ordinary, asking the waiter to add more oysters to the order. The waiter brings the guys their order, and Charlie hands the oyster to Carol, but she is mischievous and refuses. Carol's phone starts ringing, and she reads a message saying that the martial arts exam will be held early. Carol's friend also receives this message, and is surprised that this exam will now be mandatory. Carol's friend tells her friend that this is indeed true, and complains that it will be held ahead of schedule. Charlie encourages the young man, patting him on the shoulder and saying that his qualifications are not enough in any case. The young man replies that at the age of seven, he was greatly frightened by someone else, and while he destroyed him, he managed to develop a mental illness. Charlie does not miss the opportunity to show off, and immediately begins to show off, saying that he would have handled it differently in a matter of minutes. Carol says most people would run away in a situation like this, adding that even if everything feels normal, others won't go away. The guys wilt from such gloomy thoughts, and Charlie decides to defuse the situation by offering everyone a drink. He tries to make a toast, but they are interrupted by the loud sound of a siren echoing throughout the mall. Carol's face changes and says that this is a pollution sensor siren, which indicates that someone else has entered the territory. A crowd of people begins to panic and tries to run out of the building, not allowing anyone to pass. Carol's friend says there are too many people, adding that it will be impossible for them to get out. Carol tries to calm everyone down, saying that they need to keep their cool and slowly move towards the exit. However, Charlie solves the problem a little more simply and breaks a hole in the wall so that they can get out. He runs outside and turns to his friends, telling them to hurry up. Charlie looks around and notices how a red shadow portal begins to form not far from him. A few seconds later, a huge other emerges from the portal, the likes of which Charlie has never seen. Charlie realizes that there are too many people here, so transforming now would be a bad decision. He grabs Carol's hand and runs with her and her friends away from danger. Carol notes that there should have been barriers near the shopping center, not understanding where someone else could come from here. Charlie says it's too late to talk about it, and their only option is to run away. They find a way out and are about to run towards it while the entire environment begins to change. Suddenly, the entire building begins to shake, and Charlie yells at his friends to all hold on to him. However, quite quickly the floor gives way and our heroes fall down. Charlie comes to his senses and stands up, checking himself and asking the others if they are okay. Carol and her friends say they are fine and got away with only scratches. Unfortunately, her friend is much less lucky and his leg is pinned by a piece of stone. Charlie runs up to him and says that he will help him now, asking him not to worry. Without the slightest difficulty, the main character picks up a stone fragment and throws it away. Carol takes out a container of pills from her pockets and gives some to her friend, saying that this should help him. Her friend wonders why it has become so dark and asks what this place is. Carol admits that she doesn't know anything because she hasn't been in similar situations. Charlie assumes that they are on one of the floors of the shopping center and goes to investigate. After a second, he catches that same familiar sensation to which he is accustomed on his hunts. He realizes that an entire floor, or even the entire shopping center, has been transferred to the shadow layer. Charlie notices that there are too many survivors who need immediate help. 
He remembers that there are no means of transportation in the shadow layer, so it will take the Night Watch a lot of time to get here. The most terrible risk from the point of view of the main character is that if they stay for a long time, they will fall under a large amount of pollution. Even without taking into account the threat of meeting with others, Charlie asks Carol how far away she is from the watch her father gave her. Carol remembers her watch and says that she has it right there. She activates the watch and says that she has now transmitted a signal for help, thanks to which the people from the Night Watch will come faster. Charlie notes that, among other things, this watch can resist pollution. Charlie decides not to let his guard down, since someone else could attack them at any moment. Shadow clumps appear on the floor and people start screaming that a monster has come here. However, instead, Charlie realizes that the building has begun to shake again and they again fall down one floor. Carol comes to her senses and loudly calls her friends by name, hoping that they will respond. The first to respond is her friend named Martha, who says that she is fine, after which a friend named Fred answers her call. There is a huge crack not far from them, and Martha is horrified to think that Charlie could have fallen there. In the same building, Charlie's spectator found herself coming to her senses and trying to understand what happened. She remembers that she was running out of the shopping center with her friend named Gerda, but after the alarm, everyone ran and that's where her memories end. The girl turns around to find her friend's body crushed by rubble. A huge other appears in front of the girl and swings his blade to kill her. The girl reflects that she never thought that she would end up in a horror movie, hoping that some hero would save her. However, at the last moment, the monster's attack is intercepted by Charlie, who managed to put on his shadow form. Charlie activates a new Shadow Claw ability that increases the lethality of his strikes. He rushes into battle, teleporting above another, preparing to strike him with his claws. However, the Shadow Spirit manages to quickly jump away from Charlie's series of blows. The girl lets out an excited scream, not believing that she has met her favorite blogger, surprising Charlie. She starts running around him, saying that she is his fan and watches every video, admitting that she really likes him. Charlie politely reminds the girl that her dress and tights are torn, to which she asks him where he is looking. The girl adds that if he doesn't like this, then she can run home to change into new clothes. Charlie asks her if she will even change her tights, to which she replies that she will do anything for him. The monster decides to attack again, and Charlie says that now is not the time for that, preparing for a fight. Charlie begins a new hunt and disappears into the shadows, hiding from the other to sneak up from behind. He subtly uses a shadow net to catch the back of another's head, knocking him to the ground. Charlie tries to finish off the monster with a blow of his claws, but he twists in the air and dodges the blow. Charlie notes that this guy has a lot of strength and agility, otherwise he would be dead. Charlie takes off, deciding to make one more attempt to attack. However, the monster meets Charlie with a double blade attack, knocking him back. Charlie gets to his feet as the monster splits into several identical copies at once. The girl films Charlie on her phone, wishing him good luck, promising to wear stockings for him if he wins. Inspired by this proposal, Charlie rushes into battle against an enemy outnumbering him. He easily dodges the other's heavy attacks, which cause an explosion on the ground. To prevent his opponent from attacking, Charlie uses a shadow net to entangle his opponent's blades. Seizing the moment, Charlie delivers two deadly blows to the shadow creatures, killing two in one blow. Charlie rejoices at his success, but then misses a blow from behind and another pierces his shoulder. Charlie manages to escape from the other's kill zone and runs away, trying to think of a new tactic. He notes that others are now working together, saying that this was not the case before. Charlie decides that if he continues to adhere to the same tactics, then he will have no chance of winning and decides to get the other one from afar. However, the monster, as if expecting such a decision, easily dodges the shadow matter shot. Charlie is surprised that the monster was able to react this time, although he had always succeeded in this technique before. The monster copies itself again and attacks Charlie at the same time to not give him a chance to dodge. Charlie realizes that he is not allowed to go into the shadows and tries to block the blows from others. Charlie quickly loses his health, losing it to 45% and realizing that it is impossible to continue in the same spirit. Charlie lures others to a convenient location and uses his marking skill, causing them to lose their ability to think clearly due to fear. Taking advantage of the opponent's delay, Charlie begins to destroy them one by one. Having reached the marked monster, Charlie uses decapitation and finishes off the monster. The monster dies and Charlie decides to take a breather while receiving a new system message. The system reports that the hunt was completed successfully, and his shadow form has become more powerful, adding that his abilities now consume fewer shadow points. Charlie regains his blood points and looks at the remaining others, asking them why they stopped. The main character decides that if they do not attack, he will strike first and rushes into battle again. However, as soon as Charlie breaks distance from his opponents, a flash of light explodes near them. Charlie is surprised that the flash of light was in the shadow layer and looks for its source with his eyes. Charlie notices a light where others are flocking to and feels a strange desire to join them. The source of the flame turned out to be one of the Night Watch commanders named Murphy, who has the skill of an ever-burning torch. Using his strength, he deals with several others and focuses his gaze on Charlie, 
who says that he can handle everything himself. Another appears behind Commander Murphy, but he destroys him with his power. Charlie admires the commander's strength, mentally reflecting that if he hit him, he would disappear in that second. Charlie approaches the Night Watch, saying that they were a little late and almost let him lose. When asked if he is okay, Charlie replies that he will be fine, asking him to take care of the girl he found. After taking his leave, Charlie says that he will leave the girl to them and disappears into the shadows, heading towards his friends. Murphy asks his ally if they have such a person, to which he replies that he's a famous streamer, who, however, is not particularly strong. Murphy says he had a torch in his hand and his shadow form was unharmed. Murphy decides that he needs to get this girl home first and then check on this blogger. Carol goes in search of Charlie, wandering among the mountains of dead bodies and loudly calling his name. She turns on the flashlight on her watch and whispers to herself that Charlie couldn't have died. Charlie, crushed by the stones, answers his lover and raises his hand so that she notices him. Charlie says that he is about to be crushed and Carol, in a panic, begins to throw away the stones that are lying on him. After removing a couple of rocks, Carol easily pulls Charlie out with one hand. She tells Charlie that these stones didn't put any pressure on him at all, to which he just laughs it off. Carol notices a wound on Charlie's back and asks him where he got it, but he says he has no idea when he got it. To change the subject, Charlie asks Carol about where Martha and Fred are now. Carol replies that the Night Watch came to their aid and everyone was evacuated to a safe place. Charlie asks Carol if she stayed to find him, to which she replies that if something happened to him, she wouldn't be able to look Uncle Lee in the eye. Charlie approaches Carol and hugs her tightly, glad that she stayed for him. Carol is shy and asks Charlie to let him go, to which he continues to cling to her, saying that he saw scary others with blades. Charlie says that he is very scared and asks Carol to stay with him a little longer, to which she threatens to beat him. The flirtation of the two heroes is interrupted by a bright warm light and a calm female call. A Night Watch employee comes up to them and says that she heard screams and asks if everything is okay. Carol abruptly pushes Charlie away and says that everything is fine to which the employee says that she will now take them to the exit. Charlie leaves and remembers that he forgot to absorb the essence of defeated monsters, lamenting the lost shadow glasses. After some time, Charlie and all the other survivors arrive at the Night Watch Tower. The interviewer asks Charlie his name and age, and if he's enrolling this year. An interviewer named Stella says that the latest incident has consequences in the form of the need for psychological help for some victims. Stella states that if the exam is taken during the psychological counseling period, the grade will be reduced. Charlie says that he feels everything is fine with him, assuring that there is no need for therapy. Stella says that the pollution process can occur hidden, and sometimes when it is detected, it is already too late. She adds that treatment must be completed without fail, after which Charlie clarifies with her that after treatment, he will only have 10 days left before the exam. Stella says that many similar situations have happened in past years, so the Night Watch has developed a special policy regarding this matter. According to her, based on this policy, an interested person can apply in advance. Stella explains that the pretest is done during night patrols, and the results are entered into the system, just like an exam. Charlie says that he has a guardian who also works on the night watch. Stella tells him that this makes everything easier, and asks him to say his name as she prepares to write it down. Charlie says that his guardian seems to be a civilian, and his name is Lee, which stuns Stella. She repeats her uncle's name and hovers over Charlie, asking him if he's actually working as a civilian. Charlie gets scared and asks if his uncle was fired, hoping he didn't say something out of place. Stella stands up and says she will take him straight to him, asking him to follow her. Charlie and Stella walk through the huge Night Watch headquarters, and Charlie looks around. Several members of the Night Watch pass by Charlie, actively discussing the phenomenon of blogger Yo, saying that they do not have such a person. Charlie becomes tense when he hears these conversations, and Stella asks him if everything is okay. Charlie laughs it off, saying he was just a little worried, knowing in his mind that they would find him soon, while Stella asks him to rest in his room until Lee arrives. Charlie enters the room and sees that Carol and all his friends are in the room. Carol's attention is absorbed by the very girl that Charlie saved and her stories about what she saw of blogger Yo. Charlie notices the girl and mentally says that her presence here could cause a lot of problems. Carol quickly invites Charlie to sit down and asks the girl to continue her story about Yo. The girl says that she saw you fight with 10 others at the same time and finish them all off in an instant. She adds that when others could no longer move, the Night Watch arrived, and you disappeared into the shadows, leaving his laurels. Carol wonders who this you is, saying that he is definitely not a member of the Night's Watch. The girl says that her intuition tells her that this blogger is an ordinary student, since he is in love with a girl's legs, especially if they are uncovered, just like hers. She concludes that overall he is very similar to Charlie and points the finger at him. Carol jumps on Charlie asking him if he wants to die and swings her fist. Another love showdown is interrupted by Uncle Lou, who bursts into their room. He tells Carol that he heard that she fell into the shadow layer and asks her if she is okay. Carol pulls Charlie's cheek and says she's fine, adding that Charlie feels fine too. 
Lou smiles slightly and says that since everything is fine, they should follow him. Carol and Charlie follow Uncle Lou and sit in the little room, where Uncle Lou says that this is the first time an entire store has fallen into the shadow layer. Uncle Lou takes out a cigarette and says that because of this incident, the test for them will be done earlier. Catching Carol's stern gaze, Uncle Lou decides not to smoke and calmly puts the cigarette down. He says that the test is divided into two parts, adding that the first part will test abilities and the second will test willpower. He adds that the aptitude test is known as the initial awakening, during which candidates will confront the defilement. However, according to Uncle, the test of willpower will be their spiritual will, which will determine whether they can become special. Charlie asks his uncle if strong will is the key to victory, to which he says that it is not necessary. In his opinion, willpower lies not only in the ability to endure pain, but also in belief in good and evil and resistance to evil thoughts. Charlie asks his uncle whether these points affect willpower, to which he incomprehensibly asks him why he needs to know this. Carol offendedly says that someone's thoughts are occupied with girls' legs. Somewhat embarrassing, Charlie. The uncle continues the story, saying that these three points are the most common. He adds that if these three points are distorted in any way and the heart is filled with negative emotions, then everything will go down the drain. The uncle develops his idea, saying that evil thoughts attract only evil, and negative emotions are also a kind of environmental pollution. He adds that if they accumulate over a long period of time, the pollution will eventually become overwhelming. From his point of view, all negative emotions need to be released, because if you keep them in your heart, it will not lead to anything good. Charlie thinks for a moment, trying to imagine what kind of negative emotions Carol might have in her head. However, he gets stuck on the image of her legs and loses the ability to think for a while. Uncle Lou tells Charlie and Carol to go back as the testing will begin in a while. Finally, he tells Charlie that his uncle may not be back soon, so he signed all the documents for him. He admonishes the heroes, recommending them not to worry too much and just go with the flow. Charlie and Carol tell Uncle Lou that they will certainly do as he advises and watch him go. After some time, Charlie and Carol return to the room and ask the white-haired girl where the others went, to which she replies that the workers took them. Carol asks the girl why she didn't leave, to which she replies that her parents are engaged in business and just left the city a couple of days ago, so they had to sign the papers for her admission remotely. Charlie and Carol are distracted by Fred, who's being driven by Martha in a wheelchair, and tells them that some kind of medicine was applied to his leg, and it stopped hurting completely. Charlie tells Fred that he has a serious injury, and asks him if he really wants to take the test, to which he replies that his injury will not affect the results. Martha warns the heroes, telling them not to look at Fred's self-confident face, as a few minutes ago he was sobbing in the corner. Charlie looks up and sees the main entrance doors open and a large number of people enter. Taking a closer look, Charlie notices that all the guys have incredible melancholy and sadness on their faces. Charlie inquires about the reason for their mood, to which Carol replies that they just want to live a peaceful life. Carol adds that after completing the test, they will likely begin to see visible changes. Stella enters the hall, and, looking around, she says that everyone is assembled. I suggest we get down to business. She begins the instruction by saying that the test is divided into two parts and consists of a test of ability and willpower. According to her, aptitude testing will reveal the subject's potential, destructive power, and ability to control himself, while willpower testing is aimed at identifying resistance to pollution. She adds that in previous years, first-level abilities were not allowed to take part in the challenge, but this year everyone must participate without exception. Stella continues reading the instructions saying that a test subject with enough willpower will be able to resist the contamination. However, if the test subject's willpower is inferior to his abilities, then he will only be able to pass on civilian workers. Having finished reading the instructions, she loudly slams the book shut, telling everyone present to follow her. Test takers go to the waiting room and try to keep themselves busy before the exam begins. After some time, a speaker hanging on the wall calls Martha to take the test. The doors of the testing room swing open with a loud sound, and Martha, gathering her will into a fist, goes inside. Inside a large hall, a man stands in front of her, and a mysterious object covered with a blanket. The man removes the cover from the object, and it turns out to be a huge white crystal. During the test, the lights in the waiting room go out, and subjects look only at the flashing red light above the doors. Trying to see something, Carol and Fred press themselves against the glass doors, indignant that they cannot see anything. Charlie notes that for all his time spent in the shadow layer, he feels as confident in the dark as a fish in water. Approaching the glass, he notices that there is a stone attached to his leg, which emits a faded glow. Charlie suspects that Martha is facing something truly powerful and wonders if she will be able to pass this test. However, quite quickly the test ends, and the waiting room is once again illuminated by the bright light of the bulbs. Martha calmly leaves the room and is surrounded by members, asking her how it went. Martha says that, unfortunately, she has no talent for willpower despite numerous trainings. 
Fred asks her in surprise why she wanted to become special, to which she replies that it didn't work out for her anyway. The loudspeaker announces the next test subject, who just happens to be Fred, and he flies into the room, begging himself not to become special. This time, there is no power outage, and after a while, the test ends. As Fred leaves the room, he announces that he passed the test of willpower, causing Martha to be incredibly shocked. They both slump to the floor, despondently thinking about how their wishes didn't come true, to which Carol tries to calm them down and says that they were unlucky. The next test subject called on the loudspeaker is Carol. Exhaling, Carol confidently turns to her friends and tells them that it is her turn. Carol confidently walks into the room and begins the test, emitting red energy. Charlie notices that the stone strapped to Carol's leg glows red while the others were green, which tells him that Carol's ability level is at rank 5. Carol successfully passes the test and leaves the room with undisguised excitement on her face. Charlie asks her what has exhausted her so much, to which she tells him that he will understand everything as soon as he passes the test himself. Charlie invites Carol to motivate him properly and kisses her, to which she only irritably asks him to fuck off. The loudspeaker announces that Charlie is the next test subject, and he confidently walks towards the door, waving at an indignant Carol. However, Carol quickly changes her face and sincerely wishes Charlie good luck in passing the test. Entering the testing room, Charlie meets a man who asks him if he has awakened his ability, to which he answers in the affirmative. The man gives Charlie some kind of bottle and asks him to drink its contents, then asks again whether he really awakened the ability. The man expresses sincere surprise at this turn of events, but says that he will not take unnecessary questions and suggests moving on to testing willpower. Charlie puts on a blindfold and tapes a stone to his leg, and the test begins. The man gives Charlie a pep talk, telling him not to be nervous and just move forward towards his goal. He says that since Charlie's abilities have already awakened, he will feel his consciousness separating from his body as he moves forward. Having properly prepared Charlie, the man forcefully pushes him forward with both hands. Charlie feels like he's starting to fall somewhere into the void, gradually separating from his physical body. After some time, his spiritual form ends up in a strange place, and Charlie realizes that he does not feel his body at all. However, Charlie's physical body follows all his movements, as there is some form of connection anyway. Charlie decides to fool around a little, forgetting that his physical body repeats all his pranks in the real world. The man tells Charlie to stop jumping, or his ordeal will be interrupted, after which Charlie decides to act more seriously. Seeing the crystal in the spiritual world, Charlie begins to quickly run towards it across the water, noting that this test is somehow too easy. However, after a few dozen steps, he begins to sink into the water, feeling that his body is getting heavier and breathing is becoming more and more difficult. Charlie plunges headlong into the water and feels an otherworldly influence on himself. Feelings of despair, sadness, and anger begin to overwhelm him, trying to swallow him whole. However, Charlie gets the better of them, telling himself that he needs to resist this and swims to the surface. However, the ordeal does not end there, and he hears the familiar voice of his Uncle Lee behind him. Uncle Lee tells Charlie that he is not special and will only hurt others if he continues the test. Charlie says that his uncle is not real and is only an illusion created in order to prevent him from passing the tests, after which he rushes to the crystal. An illusion of uncle teleports in front of Charlie and tells him that he is not capable enough. He continues by saying that the mountains and rivers are destroyed and others are rampaging everywhere, while Charlie can live a happy life and not bother himself with a pointless struggle. The illusion says that to be special is to be inflexible, not strong. She shows the main character a huge creature that materializes right in front of him. The huge monster is approached by illusory patrol officers, and the illusion asks if he can follow their lead. The monster begins to destroy illusory cities, pulverizing them before Charlie's eyes. The mangled bodies of a huge number of dead patrol soldiers fly into the air and fall like a shower before Charlie's feet. Illusion tells Charlie that this is the end for everyone special and asks him if he really wants to become just like them. She gets closer to Charlie and tells him that all he really wants is to be the center of attention. Illusion adds that in the same way, countless teenagers have dreams of becoming superheroes. However, from the point of view of Illusion, these are all just infantile dreams of living your own pleasure and getting everything you want. She begins to mock Charlie, mockingly retelling all his dreams from early childhood, saying that this is just his youthful maximalism. The uncle's illusion adds that the dark side of this world is not the shadow layer, and after these words, Lin Mo appears in front of Charlie, walking with a torch. She adds that even if there is a bright blazing sun above your head, there will always be something that you cannot see. The illusion says that there is nothing beautiful in this, and the life of a special person is not a fairy tale at all. And with these words, the image of Lin Mo dissolves in front of Charlie's eyes. Illusory Uncle Lee says that if Charlie becomes special, he will have to reap the fruits of his decisions. Shadow says that now they will return to the original question and again asks him if he can become special. In the physical world, Charlie's body freezes, and the members of the night watch watching the test watch closely. 
One of the women asks a colleague standing nearby how the test is going. The man says nothing has happened at this point, and Charlie has been beating around the bush this whole time. The woman says that this is normal, since not everyone can bear the pollution that Charlie inherited, to which the man replies that he agrees with her. However, only people with high stamina can advance in this test. Examining Charlie, he adds that his goals are still completely unknown to them. However, after a few seconds, the woman is surprised to tell the man that the crystal taped to Charlie's leg has turned red. The man says that this can't be because Charlie doesn't really look like he has rank 5 abilities. The woman asks the man if Charlie has a rank 6 ability, to which he replies that over several decades, only a few people have reached this rank. The man continues to watch the test and notices that the light in the crystal for some reason begins to fade. He asks the woman to quickly check his watch for abnormalities, but he says that all of Charlie's indicators are normal. The man remembers that the closer the subject can get to the crystal, the stronger his willpower, and freezes in surprise. He notes that Charlie's willpower is nevertheless weakening, which confuses him. After a few seconds, Charlie's physical body approaches the crystal point blank and tries to touch it. The man is surprised by this behavior and asks himself if this is some kind of joke, since even a person with the willpower of the sixth rank is not able to touch the crystal. Meanwhile, in the spirit world, Uncle Lee's illusion tells him that he shouldn't become special. She asks him to think about himself and his friends who may be at risk from his decision. The illusion also invites Charlie to think about the person most dear to him and shows him the illusion of Carol. Charlie touches the illusion but pulls himself together and tells Uncle Lee's projection that she has said enough. He asks her to stop chattering in his ears and offering him some cheap temptations. The main character admits that the illusion even took him by surprise at the beginning, and he thought about her words. He says that he really initially wanted to look like a hero in the eyes of others, and he didn't care about the rest. However, according to him, there were no superhumans in this world, but only ordinary people who were able to achieve success. He adds that it was the dedication of these people to their work that brought stability to the world. He says that he already enjoyed peace once, and with these words he takes a torch from the newly appeared illusion of Lin Mo. The main character says that he no longer wants to hide behind the backs of others and illuminates the area on which he stands with a bright light. He says he wants to light his own flame and light up the darkness around him. Meanwhile, Uncle Lou listens to a report from an employee who tells him that the shadow layer incident affected the second, third, and fourth floors of the mall. He adds that about 850 people were pulled into the shadow layer, among which about 700 were trapped in the shadow layer, and more than 650 were rescued. But the search is still ongoing. Uncle Lou asks another colleague what the pollution department says about this, to which he tells him that he sent him the results of the examination. The officer adds that the pollution department found several wandering spirits that were very similar in terms of bone and tissue morphology. He also adds that traces of human products were found at the scene. Another employee says that this is impossible, since everyone has their own individual traits, and during a mutation they change greatly. The uncle lights a cigarette and goes to the window, saying that apparently something strange is happening in the city. He says that some creatures hiding in the dark can no longer sit still. However, Uncle Lou's attention is distracted by a bright flash of light emanating from the test case. After a while, Uncle Lou hurriedly goes to check what happened, making his way through the crowd of onlookers. He argues that the best test of willpower is the color orange, but the color gold has never been discussed. Running into the testing room, he meets two Night Watch employees and tries to find out from them what happened. Taking a closer look, Uncle Scale notices that Charlie came close to the crystal and touched it, emitting golden light. Returning to his physical body, Charlie turns his head and notices a huge crowd of surprised participants. After a while, Uncle Ao comes up to Charlie in the break room and hands him a bottle of water. Uncle Lou says that Charlie surprised him very much by creating the golden light. Charlie quickly becomes arrogant, asking his uncle if his golden light is legendary and if it surpasses the sixth rank of abilities. Uncle says that it is difficult for him to say for sure, but he can easily dissect and study such people. Charlie nervously asks Uncle Lou not to scare him, but he tells him that there is nothing to be afraid of. He says that Charlie needs to be studied, and someone will definitely take it on, adding that information about him has been sent to a think tank for study. Charlie asks Uncle Lou if he really caused them so much trouble. Uncle Lou says that everything is fine and he will accompany him, adding that Charlie will only need to undergo a couple of procedures. After a while, Charlie enters a room where the watch officers and Uncle Lou ask him about what he does in his free time. All the other subjects watch the camera footage with interest during Charlie's interview and say that they cannot believe that such an ordinary person, who looks like Charlie, turned out to be the best. A group of unknown persons also watch the recording of this interview with interest and say that something great is coming. Continuing to answer questions, Charlie says that during the test in the illusory world, he fought with others mentally, not understanding why he was here. Uncle Lou asks him what he thought when he saw them, to which he replies that he was very excited and thought he was about to become special. He says that he felt a responsibility on his shoulders and then breaks off his story mid-sentence.
Uncle asks Charlie to continue, but he asks a counter question about the map hanging on his wall. He says that out of 10 of our places, only five have survived, adding that they are in a rather difficult situation and they need to find out the truth. Uncle Lou becomes stupefied and mentally wonders what Charlie is trying to say with his gestures. Charlie begins to say that he saw how people in the world were getting hot and cold, and he tried his best to light the torch. Charlie ends his story by saying that after he failed to light the torch, he became the only source of light. Uncle Lou tells his co-workers that Charlie sometimes likes to goof off beyond measure. However, to his surprise, his colleagues admit that they thought Charlie's story would be so touching. They continue their thought, saying that they are sure that Charlie will have a happy future in the Night Watch, adding that now they absolutely understand why he recreated the Golden Light. Colleagues conclude that Charlie is incredibly talented, and the other test subjects watching the broadcast realize that they are no match for him. Charlie mentally hopes that he will be allowed to go home very soon, since he wants to go for a massage. Uncle tells Charlie that he is free to go, adding that he will be sent notices. Charlie asks his uncle what kind of pressure he should be under, to which he replies that he will be invited to a special training camp. Uncle Lou also tells Charlie that he asked him to keep his head down, adding that now everyone on the Night Watch knows about him. Uncle Lou says he doesn't know what to say to Uncle Lee, reminding him that he wouldn't want Charlie to become special and suggesting that he will start to get angry. He sums it up and says that Charlie can return home, since nothing can be changed anyway, asking him to remember to come to training camp on March 25th. Uncle Lou says that people like him will undergo special training for several months, after which he will take the final martial arts exam. Finally, he asks Charlie not to mention what happened in front of Carol and says goodbye to him. After some time in the shadow layer, he remembers his words and checks the rest of his life, noticing that he has 20 days left to live. Charlie realizes that his next payment on his life begins in a few months, so he must hunt as much as possible to extend his life. At that very moment, he discovers someone running away from something else with very little health. Realizing that he had a great opportunity, he activates shadow walking, which allows him to move on any surface, and rushes down the sheer wall. Having approached the monster, Charlie puts a mark on it and also activates the chase effect and beheads the monster. Charlie absorbs the body of a defeated monster, increasing his remaining life by two days. He thanks fate for the fact that he noticed this goal in such a timely manner, which was incredibly easy for him. Suddenly, someone calls out to Charlie, and he turns his head in surprise, not expecting to hear a human voice in the shadow layer. Turning around, he sees in front of him a man dressed in motorcycle protective equipment who asks him where his friend went. Charlie asks him about something else and realizes that he got carried away by the process, leaving only a pile of bones from his prey. The man is outraged, calling Charlie a thief and saying that he will pay for his crimes. Lose your temper, he tells Charlie to stop pretending and admit that he stole what belongs to this man. He charges at Charlie but suddenly breaks, stopping right in front of his face. He takes off his headband and helmet and carefully walks around Charlie, examining him. After a few seconds, the man shouts out that he knows Charlie, calling him by his nickname Yo, saying that he has watched every one of his broadcasts and is a big fan of his. He hugs him and takes out his phone to take a selfie, asking Charlie to smile, and says that he should have divided the spoils according to the rules. Charlie asks him what kind of rule these are and who came up with them. In response to this, the man begins to record a video, shouting that the streamer you stole the loot from a harmless collector and did not even apologize. To prevent the flow of misinformation, Charlie uses the shadow grid skill and pulls the man towards her. Grabbing him by the head, he demands normal explanations from him and not circus tricks. The young man says that he will tell him everything, rubbing the bruised area with his hand. He says that they are freelance members of the Night Watch, adding that once he reaches mid-level rank one, he can join them. Charlie asks the man interestedly about what freelancers do. The man admits that they don't earn that much, citing a figure of six, 7,000 yuan. Charlie, who has never even seen such money, is discouraged and asks the man why he considers this a small salary. He asks the man to show at least a little respect, since Charlie himself receives much less than this amount. The man replies that he understands Charlie's indignation, but their salary is justified by the fact that they rely only on themselves and can die at any time. He also adds that the monster Charlie killed was just a battered one that strayed from the pack. The man begins to bag the remains of the other, and Charlie wonders who he is selling them to. The man replies that he sells them to the Night Watch, universities, and some companies with suitable qualifications. According to him, they give a task to capture a certain species and, in addition, send information about the location. Charlie is very impressed by his last words and asks the man to share his QR code. He says that he will come back and add it, adding that he will also give 7,000 yuan for another. The man replies that 4,900 yuan is enough for him as a reward for such information. Charlie hugs the man and says he can't let you be so petty about your new friend. He also adds that he would very much like to chat with him about their future collaboration. After some time, Charlie catches up with his next prey, which is something called a shadow cat. Charlie takes her by surprise and lifts the body impaled by her claws above him using shadow bite. 
Charlie reasons that he should try to absorb the monster while trying to leave the body intact so that it can be sold. Having successfully completed this task, he gives a signal to his new business partner, saying that he can take the remains. Charlie's friend says that he is incredibly kind, since he is ready to share such loot, and joyfully calls him brother. Charles tells him that his part of the job is also very important, since he needs to find out the location and take the body to the Night's Watch. The man says that in fact this work can be done alone if you register. Charlie replies that he wants to maintain confidentiality, adding that he is afraid of what might happen if the Night Watch people find out about his identity. The man says that Charlie killed four others in a day, thereby setting a record, to which he replies that he can kill a hundred if he has time. However, in his mind, he reasons that the others he absorbed did not make him stronger, suggesting that monsters with the first rank would be more suitable for him as prey. He decides to ask his partner, Daniel, for help finding others of the first rank. Daniel replies that this task is almost impossible due to its complexity. He explains that all others of the first rank are extremely dangerous, and the risk remains too high. Charlie says that he is well aware of the danger that others of the first rank pose, but nevertheless, he is going to deal with them. After some time, Charlie returns to his apartment, happy that he is finally home, but suddenly he hears Carol's voice. Looking back, he sees that the girl is lying on the sofa and looking at the phone, telling him that she has been waiting for him for a very long time. Charlie takes a cookie from the refrigerator and sits on her couch, asking where Uncle Lou is. Carol tells him that he is on a mission, after which Charlie asks her if he will return today, to which she answers him in the negative, wondering the reason for his curiosity. Charlie makes a pleased face and tells Carol that she can stay with him today. Carol, in her usual manner, responds to Charlie with a gentle slap on the wrist and asks him how the test went. Charlie, upset, replies that everything went well and asks her why she is interested in this. Carol asks him what level of abilities he was assigned, to which he hesitantly answers that he has a third level, mentally deciding that it is not worth telling her the truth. Approaching him, she asks him what abilities he has, to which Charlie answers something, calling his class a shadow. Carol replies that he has a lot of potential, but since his ability is an auxiliary ability, he shouldn't bother. Charlie wonders why Carol waited so long for him and asks her about her abilities. Carol happily replies that her ability class is called Spirit, adding that this class has the highest potential. She adds that at the early stage, the combat power of these abilities is not particularly strong, but at the late stage, everything changes dramatically, and she realizes that Carol has come to show off in front of him. Charlie decides to sober up Carol a little and gently flicks her on the nose, telling her not to waste words. Carol does not remain in debt and also flicks Charlie's nose, moving closer to him again. Shy from the current situation, the heroes move away from each other, and Charlie tells Carol that they are now a shadow man and a guardian of souls. Carol says that she also doesn't quite understand this classification and only knows that others have the same names. She says that Charlie's shadow corresponds to the shadow of the other, her guardian of souls corresponds to the spirit of the other. Carol says that they need to hunt others without being contaminated in order to become stronger, adding that if they hunt something suitable and new, the efficiency of development increases. Charlie says that Carol's skill sounds really cool and invites her to demonstrate her abilities. Carol tells him that there are no others here, to which Charlie says that she can test her skill on him, assuring him that everything will be fine. After some time, Carol gives in to persuasion and uses force on Charlie, instantly knocking him to the floor. Frightened, he quickly sits down next to Charlie and asks him if everything is okay with him. Taking advantage of the moment, Charlie quickly puts his head on her lap and asks her to pet her. Taken by surprise, Carol doesn't catch the trick and starts stroking his head. Charlie tells Carol that she is very strong, admitting that he was ready to defend himself, but still fell into the trap. Carol says that their powers come from different others, so it's normal that he couldn't resist. Charlie asks Carol if she thinks she might become a target for everyone while they are at the training camp, to which she says that she likes the intensity, adding that she suspects there will be other strong students from the area there. Charlie asks Carol about what levels the students will have on staff and tells him not to worry, since it is unlikely that there will be anyone much stronger than them. Carl suddenly changes the subject and remembers that Charlie loves massages and asks him how much he would pay a masseuse. Charlie tells her that he would pay the masseuse several thousand yuan, which clearly does not please Carol, again dooming himself to jealous punishment. After some time, Charlie goes hunting again in the shadow lair and watches a large other devouring his own kind. Charlie asks Daniel if the monster in front of them is the very same other of the first rank, to which he answers in the affirmative, adding that he specifically chose the one with whom Charlie had already dealt. Charlie prepares to attack and Daniel asks him if he needs help, but he says he can handle it himself. Before Daniel can come to his senses, a stone falls down on the other's head, knocking him to the ground. After destroying the monster with one blow, Charlie receives a notification that his Shadow Thread skill has been improved, and he can now release several of them at once. Daniel watches with his mouth agape, amazed at how strong Charlie is. 
Meanwhile, somewhere in an unknown place, the man is surrounded by many others, and he flies into the air, entangling himself with lightning. Having accumulated a sufficient charge, he unleashes all his power on others, destroying an entire group with one blow. What happens turns out to be a video of the fight, which Carol watches on her laptop. Carol is very impressed by what she sees, saying that this battle looks incredibly powerful. Uncle Lou approaches her and says that not everyone can awaken the ability she possesses, admitting that he is very impressed. He says that there was previously a person who awakened a similar ability, adding that a recording of the early stage of its cultivation is on a flash drive. Carol asks her father if he has achieved such power, to which he replies in the negative, adding that Uncle Lou achieved the same. Carol mentally wonders why Uncle Lou is showing this to her, despite the fact that such information would be useful to Charlie. Meanwhile, in his apartment, Uncle Lee looks at the sunset sky and is immersed in memories. He remembers a disaster in which a body was discovered surrounded by a ring of light that hung in the air and engulfed anyone who looked at it for too long in pollution. During the battle with this entity, two divisions were completely destroyed, three generals were wounded during the battle, and 300 members of the Night's Watch were injured, after which all survivors were taken away and their files were carefully classified, assigning the codename God to the mysterious entity. Meanwhile, Charlie continues to hunt others in the shadow lair, finding his next prey. He makes a botched attack and his opponent hits him hard in the face, knocking him to the ground. Realizing that his health has dropped to 66%, Charlie decides to change tactics. Charlie watches as the monster rushes at him at high speed to tear him apart with its claws. At the decisive moment, Charlie gets to his feet and takes out a stick-shaped cookie, biting off a piece with a satisfied face. A second later, the monster explodes, flying into pieces that fall at Charlie's feet. Charlie successfully uses his skill, which allows him to produce additional damage when penetrating the body of an enemy. Daniel, who was filming the entire fight, approaches Charlie and says that it was impressive, suggesting that it will be the explosion part of the video that will make the biggest splash. Charlie compliments Daniel on his good camera work and begins to figure out his skills while Daniel begins collecting the remains of the other. Looking through his profile, he notices that his lifespan has been extended to 47 days and mentally rejoices that now he doesn't have to worry about training camp. Charlie asks Daniel to prepare his next opponent, to which he replies that everything is almost ready. However, at the same instant, a projectile filled with otherworldly energy rushes at our heroes at great speed. Charlie manages to react and grabs Daniel out of the way of the projectile, looking around in search of the enemy. A huge other appears in front of Charlie and Daniel, representing a large eye with tentacles. Charlie feels a familiar power in this other, remembering the words of his beloved that her guardian corresponds to the spirit of the other. Charlie rushes to the attack realizing that his only chance is to neutralize the monster as quickly as possible before he has time to attack again. However, before Charlie reaches the monster, a golden spear flies towards the monster, killing it on the spot. A few seconds later, the owner of the spear appears on the body of the defeated monster, dressed in fancy armor. Without saying anything, the man flies into the air, leaving behind only a small brochure. After reading the brochure, Charlie learns about the existence of the Haiyang group, which helps people become special and stand out. After some time, Charlie comes to Hyun's office, which is a huge skyscraper. Charlie carefully examines the skyscraper and the huge statue standing nearby, and remembers the words of his friend Daniel. He told Charlie that Hyun is the largest pharmaceutical company in the city. He also added that if a person becomes an employee of this group, then he no longer has to worry about anything, since his future immediately becomes secure. Charlie asks Daniel if the person who killed the spirit was a Hyun employee. He answers in the affirmative, saying that his characteristic uniform immediately gave him away. Charlie is surprised that this man dealt with someone of the second rank without straining. Daniel said that Hyan produces doping that enhances the abilities of his employees. He adds that Hyan is working with the Night's Watch to help develop one. According to him, Hyan is the best solution if someone wants to become stronger in the shortest possible time. Charlie asks Daniel if he wants this, to which he replies that he is on his own and has never thought about it. In the present time, one of the employees introduces the crowd to new drugs called T-1928. She says that this drug was developed by a doctor from Beidou and Mr. X, who has headed the company for 10 years. The co-worker says that the drug helps increase brain activity, and Charlie mentally tells himself that it sounds tempting, but there is no certainty about whether the drug actually works. Having finished her story, the employee says that now they really need a volunteer from the crowd. At the same moment, Daniel begins to jump out of the crowd, shouting at the top of his lungs that he is volunteering. Charlie, stunned that Daniel tricked him into saying he was on his own, watches him down the bottle of the drug in one gulp. Daniel's eyes begin to emit rays of light, and he screams that he feels his brain has become stronger. The employee says that the original price of the drug is 8,000 yuan, but today there is a special offer in which the price is reduced to 1,800. The crowd is incredibly impressed by the test results and begins to approach the employee in large numbers. 
After observing their behavior for a few seconds, Charlie turns away and leaves, mentally telling himself that they can't be helped. He walks into the Hyen Gallery and stops next to a painting dedicated to the company's founder, Stan Hyen. Charlie is surprised that Stan Hyen founded his own company and was a member of the Night Watch. The commander of the Night Watch, Murphy, approaches him and says that all this is true, but unfortunately, few people remember about it now. Charlie recognizes him and mentally admits to himself that he saw Murphy during the attack on the shopping center. Murphy says that in the 50th year of the disaster, Stan Hyen single-handedly led the mass evacuation of the occupied territory. According to Murphy, Stan did not hesitate to set himself on fire to destroy everyone else, thereby protecting people. However, according to him, as a result of this brave decision, Stan Hyen burned to the ground, leaving not even bones behind. Murphy also adds that, fortunately, his descendants have grown the Hyen company and continue to make enormous contributions to the business. Murphy tells Charlie that he reminds him a lot of Stan Hyen. Charlie does not understand Murphy to which he reminds him of the test day and his words that he wants to become the only light in the pitch darkness. Charlie remembers his words and mentally admits that he blurted them out without putting much meaning into them. Murphy tells Charlie that he deserves to be related to General Lee, surprising him. Charlie clarifies which general he is talking about, to which he confidently describes Charlie as his uncle. Charlie can't believe his ears, remembering how strangely his uncle sometimes behaved, and is still trying to wrap his head around the idea that he is one of the strongest soldiers of the Night Watch. Murphy asks if his uncle told him about his position before, to which he admits that all his life, he thought that his uncle was a simple worker. Charlie mentally thinks that now his uncle's words about another way out don't seem strange to him. Murphy assumes that General Lee is keeping an eye on Charlie for his own good and introduces himself, saying that he works as an instructor at a training camp. He wishes him good luck and expresses great hope that their training will go as smoothly as possible. After Murphy leaves, Charlie admits to himself that he has a very bad feeling about it. He looks back at the painting and notices that otherworldly powers are beginning to emanate from it. A few seconds later, a different form of a large worm flies out of the picture at great speed. Charlie realizes that this is a wandering spirit and chases him, trying to understand how he ended up here. Chasing someone else up the stairs, he tries to understand how the spirit was able to get inside with such good security. Charlie's shadow instinct tells him that this wandering spirit is not as simple as it seems at first glance. Charlie continues to pursue the monster and mentally suggests that the sensation of the appearance of others may be connected with something important. Charlie realizes that he is in the company's basement, but the lack of staff there haunts him. Suddenly he hears someone's voice and decides to hide in the shadow layer to find out what is happening in this company. Charlie uses the shadow pupil skill and quickly falls into the otherworldly layer. Having crossed to the other side, Charlie suddenly finds himself in a strange laboratory filled with a large number of capsules. Taking a closer look at them, Charlie discovers that they contain others of very different sizes and ranks. Meanwhile, two scientists are walking down the corridor, and the assistant tells the doctor that the cultivation of the wandering spirit is going as expected, adding that Mr. Stan said that he would like to take control of the bloody subspecies. The assistant asks the doctor if he has any ideas about this. The doctor replies that the others are quite difficult to tame, noting that the three wandering spirits were a great example of this, and if they tried to first capture the bloody subspecies, they could lose a lot. The assistant tells the doctor that the previous use of flesh and blood to attract the bloody species has borne fruit, to which he replies that it is impossible to rely on that alone. The doctor emphasizes that their ultimate goal is to develop a controllable other that can help the Night's Watch, and the first step is to take control of the spirit. He approaches one of the others and says that this spirit ended up in their hands after it was rejected by his own. The doctor greets the other, calling him number nine and asks him how he is doing. The assistant warns the doctor, but he tells him not to worry and just take notes. The doctor knocks on the glass of the capsule and asks the other whether he likes his new eyes. The other extends its clawed paw, partially penetrating the thick glass. The doctor is very pleased with this behavior and notes that the other's mood is finally stabilizing, adding that the next step is to create more copies that could fight the others. He asks the assistant to bring some stones and give them to number nine. Charlie, observing the other, wonders if he can see it. He notes that this other is not like the wandering spirit he encountered previously, as he is not aggressive and is communicating. After observing number nine for some time, Charlie realizes that the creature has some consciousness. The assistant asks the doctor whether this experiment will get out of control and whether such others will also fight against people. The doctor calmly answers the assistant, saying that he believes in the possibility of resolving all the problems that have arisen. The assistant suggests further testing, citing the example of replacing the soul of someone else with a human one. The doctor grabs the assistant and says that this idea is unacceptable, as it goes beyond all limits of what is permitted. However, the elderly doctor immediately begins to cough violently, and the assistant holds him down apologizing for the fact that he blurted out too much. 
However, at that same second, the assistant thrusts a knife into the scientist's chest, causing him to spit blood in incredible agony. The assistant says that the doctor's research is coming to an end. He takes off his glasses and says that this is not what he came for when he got a job here. After these words, he raises his hand up and concentrates a clot of otherworldly energy in it. Concentrating at full power, he releases his energy, destroying all capsules containing others. At the same second, the control system of the scientific complex warns about the escape of others from room 35, declaring a red threat level. An assistant, distorted by otherworldly energy, looks after the fleeing personnel. A few seconds later, he falls to the floor with a heavy crash, lying motionless. Charlie comes out of disguise and is surprised that the student killed his teacher and then committed suicide. Looking around, he notices that the doctor is still showing signs of life and decides to help him. Approaching the still-living doctor, Charlie tells him not to move, but he keeps telling him something about the fiery appearance. Charlie tries to find out more details from the doctor, but he quickly bleeds out and dies before he can explain anything. Charlie shakes the doctor's body, asking him not to play riddles, but after making sure that the doctor is dead, he becomes furious. Turning around, Charlie notices something different and decides that first he needs to exterminate all the monsters. After looking around and making sure that there are no more monsters in this room, Charlie summons Shadow Claws and prepares to attack. A second later, Charlie rushes to attack, but the other one knocks him down and slams him into the wall. However, he is prevented from finishing off the new ones by two others who came to the rescue. So he goes aside for a while to finish them off. Having dealt with others, he notices a huge number of killed employees, realizing that others have gone to the outside world. Meanwhile, one of the employees, Hayang, continues to present her pharmaceutical products. The alarm in the building does not have time to go off, and others attack the unsuspecting girl from the ceiling. The girl dies on the spot, and other visitors run away in panic to escape the monsters. Daniel tries to calm the crowd, saying that the bloody kind doesn't just attack, so they need to stick together. He desperately asks people not to run away, but no one even thinks of listening to him. While trying to save other people, Daniel does not notice how someone else creeps up behind him and rushes to attack. However, Charlie manages to come to the rescue and knocks out the otherworldly creature with one blow. Daniel is sincerely happy that Charlie came to the rescue, but Charlie tells him to help people. Daniel complains to the main character that no one is listening to him because the crowd is in a panic. Charlie rushes to attack yet another, saving another civilian from imminent death at the last moment. Having attracted the attention of the crowd, he shouts and orders everyone not to be a fool and avoid the attacks of the monsters. The crowd recognizes Charlie as the streamer Yu and begins to applaud him, shouting that they are all saved. Charlie orders them all to look around and tell him if they find anything strange, adding that children and women should be published first. After some time, the crowd evacuates the building and Charlie decides that his help is no longer needed here. He tells Daniel to let the rest of the civilians get out, adding that he will go investigate himself. Meanwhile, a woman and her little daughter were locked in a building nearby due to a fire and accompanying destruction. Someone breaks through the rubble, making it impossible to get out, and the woman joyfully shouts to her savior that they are here. However, from behind the smoke screen, a wandering spirit flies out at them, preparing to devour them both. But after a second, shadow threads entangle the monster's toothy mouth, and it stops under the force of tension. Charlie forcefully pulls the threads towards himself, throwing the otherworldly monster into the air and making it defenseless. Seizing the right moment, Charlie jumps out of the ambush and pierces the other through with a blow of his claws. The woman in tears thanks Charlie for saving her, clearing her throat of smoke. Charlie, meanwhile, is trying to shake off the flames that spread to him from the monster. Having dealt with this incident, he approaches the woman with the child, but the girl cries and says that Charlie looks worse than a monster. Holding the girl and child tightly, he asks them not to be afraid of anything and to hold on to him properly. The main character uses a shadow thread to latch onto a building and jumps out into the street, trying to find a place to drop off civilians. After a minute, he notices the place where the firefighters and rescuers have arrived and decides to land there. Mother and daughter again thank Charlie for saving her, and onlookers film the incident on their phones, saying that streamer Yo saved the woman and child. Charlie again enjoys the shadow away, the joyful applause of all the people he and Daniel saved. Charlie mentally thinks that he needs to speed up, since the shadow glasses are used up very quickly, expressing the hope that the people from the Night Watch will arrive here very soon. A few minutes later, he notices that people from the Night Watch have already arrived, and a suspicion creeps into his head that all this was planned. Meanwhile, a group of monsters decide to attack Night Watch Commander Murphy, surrounding him. However, with the help of his skill, he wipes out otherworldly creatures from the face of the earth, dividing the flame into several rays. The entire Haiyan Tower begins to burst at the seams, and loud explosions are heard on different floors. Charlie realizes that the Haiyan Industrial Zone is the main target for attack by others, and decides to further check everything for survivors. Charlie realizes that there are no people from the Night Watch here, so he will have to rely only on himself and checks his indicators. After some time, 
Charlie reaches the survivors and begins to slowly bring them down using his shadow thread skills. Charlie tries his best to save as many people as possible, using up his last strength. After some time of action, Charlie notices Commander Murphy from the Night Watch. Charlie lands on the ground, having evacuated the last civilian, and exhales tiredly. Charlie falls to the ground and realizes that he is so tired that he can barely get up, admitting to himself that being a hero is very difficult. However, looking at the civilians rejoicing over their salvation, he realizes that it was worth it. Suddenly, one of the grandmothers begins to loudly ask the others if anyone has seen her granddaughter. Other rescued people also begin to panic and search for their children, saying that they are missing. Charlie says he didn't see anyone and is very surprised that all the missing people are children. Raising his head up, he notices that some others have grabbed the children and are heading in an unknown direction. He's mentally surprised that he is in charge of these others and does not understand why they suddenly needed children. His thoughts are interrupted by a sudden phone call from Carol. Picking up the phone, he asks her what happened, to which she responds with a counter question about whether he is in Hyen's company at the moment. Charlie asks her how she knows this, to which she asks him not to ask, but to simply return home. Charlie answers by the time she finishes preparing the beef and tomato salad and egg soup. Carol tries to say something to the main character, but he immediately hangs up, leaving her alone with her thoughts. Charlie realizes that he has very little blood and shadow glasses left, so he needs to hurry. Rising to his feet, he finds Uncle Lou standing in front of him and several Night Watch soldiers, who order him to freeze in place. Uncle Lou says that according to Law Number 113, non-Night Watch members are prohibited from using their abilities publicly and demands that he stop, adding that they will take action if he refuses. Charlie raises his hands, mentally telling himself that it is better to leave everything to the Night's Watch, since they are more qualified and will definitely be able to help. He turns his head and hears the crying of the unfortunate old woman, who continues to search for her granddaughter. Realizing that every second counts, he turns to the Night Watch and asks them to follow him. With these words, he uses a shadow thread and soars into the air, heading after the others who kidnapped the children. One of the fighters prepares to shoot Charlie, but Uncle Lou motions for them to lower their weapons and asks them to watch. Meanwhile, others continue to kidnap children, taking them to an unknown direction. Charlie tries to follow them and notices that they are leaving with the abductees into the shadow layer. Having dived to the other side after them, Charlie continues to monitor the monsters swarming with others. Charlie mentally reasons that the situation is taking a dangerous turn, since the monsters before are now kidnapping people instead of killing them. Charlie understands that there is some connection between the high-end company, the fiery species' biological experiments, and the fact that others have begun to behave in an organized manner. Charlie realizes he's gotten himself into something terrible, but it's too late for him to back out. After a while, one of the monsters guarding the children is distracted by the sound of a small pebble bouncing off the walls. The monster decides that the children are playing around, but throwing the pebble again causes him to be distracted. Angry, the monster looks at the children and suddenly notices that there are fewer of them. The monsters begin to look around and notice Charlie, who is trying to quietly evacuate the children, distracting others with stones. Charlie realizes that his plan has failed and he has been discovered. Enraged, otherworldly creatures rush at Charlie, and he tries to come up with a plan of action. The main character uses his skills of shadow threads and entangles all the monsters with a strong net. The monsters, unable to continue the chase, begin to growl menacingly, trying in vain to gnaw through the shadow net. Having gotten rid of the chase, Charlie leads the children behind him, lighting their way with a flashlight. Thinking he's in a safe place, he opens his contacts book and dials the night watch, trying to tell them he has an important message. However, suddenly the phone explodes right in his hands for unknown reasons. A man with snake skin and eyes comes out of the darkness and says that he had no hope among a man from the Night Watch. He adds that he knows Charlie, calling him a celebrity named Brother Yo. Charlie shields the children and summons ghostly claws, asking the stranger who he is. A stranger with a malicious smile demands to guess the name, concentrating his power in his finger. After a few seconds, he decides to release his power with a slight movement, causing an explosion in the wall. Charlie is surprised by the incredible abilities of the mysterious stranger, that he is also special. Realizing that now is not the best time for a fight, he decides to take his opponent away from the children. However, having landed on the asphalt nearby, Charlie hears several dozen iron rods flying at his back. The stranger says that Charlie's reaction is exactly as in the video, adding that he is impressed. However, according to him, Charlie's strength is only at the first level, and this disappoints him. Charlie asks a mysterious stranger if he is an employee of the Hyen Corporation. The stranger just grins arrogantly and asks Charlie if his appearance really gives him away. Charlie realizes that the stranger is mocking him and asks him if he is a member of the fire species. The stranger tells Charlie that the dead are not supposed to know much and attacks him with poisonous bubbles. Charlie tries to dodge the stranger's attacks, deftly maneuvering around, but one of the bubbles still overtakes him. There is a powerful explosion and Charlie is thrown several meters away. 
The stranger decides to finish off Charlie and rains down several dozen more bubbles on him, causing a series of explosions. He admits out loud to himself that he is disappointed and expected much more from the local superstar. The children watch what is happening from a building nearby and with sad tears hope that Charlie is alive. After waiting for the dust from the explosions to settle, the stranger decides to approach the craters and discovers that Charlie is missing. Charlie quietly emerges from the shadows and sneaks up on the mysterious stranger to silently neutralize him. The main character strikes with a shadow stroke, but the stranger manages to dodge, escaping with only a slight wound in the face. Charlie continues to attack the stranger, now and then emerging from the shadows, and he again manages to take the enemy by surprise. However, the stranger anticipates Charlie's attack and dodges while summoning an acid sphere. Charlie disappears into the shadows again, and the stranger calls him a pathetic rat, launching the acid sphere again. Charlie intercepts the sphere and reflects it into a nearby building, causing a shadow explosion. After receiving minor injuries from the explosion, the stranger mockingly tells Charlie that he is hiding in the shadows and attacking on the sly. He adds that he will also fight according to his own rules if Charlie refuses to come out for a fair fight. With these words, he creates a large acid sphere and launches it in an unexpected direction, throwing it behind him. Charlie realizes that the stranger has launched a deadly sphere at the children watching the fight. At the last moment, Charlie manages to emerge from the shadows and take the blow on himself, covering the child with himself. However, before he can come to his senses, a stranger appears behind him and tells the main character that he has finally caught him. Charlie does not have time to react, and a mysterious opponent delivers a crushing blow to him in the back. From the incredible force of the impact, Charlie flies several tens of meters away, landing on bags of garbage. The stranger approaches him and asks him why he was so hopeful of hiding in the shadows, adding that he had no chance. He begins to rain down blows on the weakened Charlie, and the main character realizes that his shadow form is beginning to collapse. The stranger grabs Charlie's face and lifts him up, while Charlie feels that due to the destroyed shadow shell he cannot use his abilities. The stranger breaks part of the shadow shape on Charlie's face and says that it's time to find out who he is. He decides to finish off Charlie with one hand, holding him by the throat, and with the other creating a poisonous sphere to bring it down on the main character. When the stranger has almost finished concentrating the energy of the poisonous sphere on his head, a brick suddenly falls. Looking up, he sees that the kids have decided not to sit idly by and, shouting for him to let Charlie go, continue to throw stones at him. After calling the kids brats, the stranger angrily asks them what the hell they are doing. The stranger briefly forgets about Charlie, becomes distracted by the children, and decides to launch a poisonous sphere at them. Charlie takes advantage of a moment's respite and, having regained a small amount of strength, grabs the stranger from behind, telling him to fight only him. Before the stranger can fight back, Charlie uses his multiple shadow pupil skill to keep the children safe. The stranger is stunned by such a chaotic onslaught of shadow skills, and Charlie stabs him in the back, after which he jumps back. The stranger turns around and tells Charlie that now the baby will no longer help him. Charlie tells the stranger that his blood is under control and asks him why they needed to kidnap children. The stranger replies that the souls of children are much purer and tells the main character to listen to his family. Charlie remembers the creatures from the laboratory as well as identical others from the shopping center and tries to understand what his opponent means. Having come to his senses, he notices that he is surrounded by others and the stranger says that it is time to die. The others attack Charlie at the same time, but he says with a smile on his face that the fun is just beginning. Using the enhanced skill of shadow threads, he entangles others, thanking the stranger for the gift. Charlie begins to move from one to another, using his usual skills of chasing and decapitation, devouring his victims. The stranger is stupefied when he sees that Charlie has the skill of absorbing otherworldly creatures. Continuing to feed on others, Charlie turns into a whirlpool, sucking in weak opponents. The stranger tries to stop this process by shrouding himself in otherworldly energy and striking a whirlpool, but his efforts are in vain. The stranger gets angry and tells himself that all he can do is use the blood. However, from a shadow whirlpool in front of him, a huge entity appears, resembling an egg in shape. Cursing Charlie with his last words, the stranger tries to run away from this sphere as fast as he can. He admits to himself that this is the first time he has seen someone special absorb someone else, and he wonders if this makes him just as much of a monster. However, the stranger does not manage to run far, and a shadowy funnel appears before his eyes. The otherworldly energy dissipates, and Charlie appears in front of him, having completely restored his shadow form. However, in addition to recovery, Charlie also acquired new abilities that allow him to create shadow swords. Charlie admits to himself that he feels as if he has gotten rid of everything bad in his body and unleashed his powers. Concentrating on his condition, he realizes that heaven and earth have become visible much more clearly, and everything has begun to acquire new colors. The main character looks up at the stranger. He feels an unbearably strong fear blowing from him. With thoughts that he really wants to play with his victim, Charlie disappears in the blink of an eye, leaving behind only a small cloud of fog. 
The stranger mentally tells you that this time Charlie has dived headfirst into the day and he can't find him. In desperation, he shouts to Charlie that he is ready to fight him and calls on several others to help him. However, in the blink of an eye, all of his minions are cut into pieces by dark strokes of swords. Before he knows it, the stranger feels an incredible cutting pain in his chest. The stranger panics and thinks that he can't see Charlie's attacks because he's too fast and asks you how someone with rank 2 can be so strong. Charlie, who can now hide in deeper shadows, quietly approaches the stranger and reasons that his opponent's face shows all his emotions and fears. He lands several more blows on his opponent, continuing to torture him. The main character admits to himself that he takes incredible pleasure in playing with his prey. The stranger shouts at Charlie to kill him if he wants and not continue to mock him. Charlie appears behind the stranger and presents a sword to his throat, saying that he will grant his wish. He brings the sword a little closer, and the stranger realizes that his fate is sealed and he will not be able to get out of this situation. However, at the same moment, someone throws a piece of tile, thereby distracting Charlie and giving the stranger the opportunity to escape. Suddenly, another stranger enters the arena, calling out Charlie's first opponent as Jones and asking him what the hell he's doing. He adds that they waited for him for half a day and emphasizes that the boss is very unhappy. Jones is surprised to see his comrade Sailor here and asks him if his boss sent him here. Sailor replies that their plan begins now and orders him to take the children, adding that he will deal with the rest himself. Jones agrees and runs down the block, saying that he is leaving this patient to him. Charlie dives into the shadows and jumps out next to Jones, shouting at him to leave the children alone and brandishing his swords. However, he does not have time to launch an attack, as Sailor attacks him and knocks him down. Charlie quickly rises to his feet and lunges towards Sailor as he charges his fists with otherworldly energy. Sailor attacks Charlie, but he dodges thanks to his agility and jumps to the side. Meanwhile, Jones uses his power quietly, concentrating it in just one finger. He binds Charlie with poison ropes, preventing him from moving and attacking. Taking advantage of the moment, Sailor delivers a powerful blow, charged with otherworldly energy, to Charlie's body. Jones shouts to Sailor to finish off Charlie, but suddenly a hail of blows rains down on him, dismembering his body. Before he can understand what happened, Jones falls to the ground, dead, blood beginning to flow continuously from his severed limbs. Sailor takes a cold look at the body of her fallen comrade and praises Charlie's skills, asking him if he works on the Night Watch. He asks Charlie about the reason why he interferes in their affairs, to which the protagonist says that Sailor is using children to conduct experiments on others, which is unacceptable from his point of view. Sailor says that Charlie decided to play the hero, to which he replies that he is a hero and never wanted to become one. The main character adds that he just sticks to what he thinks is right and prepares for battle. Sailor just chuckles at his words and says that if Charlie saves the children, then all of humanity will be destroyed. Charlie doesn't understand what Sailor is talking about and asks him how kidnapping children can save the world. Sailor tells Charlie that the war between humans and others has been going on for hundreds of years. From his point of view, it was only thanks to the efforts of his group that people were still alive. However, Sailor concludes that others are still much stronger than humans, and human strength is like fire, which is simply not able to illuminate everything around. Sailor says that they found another way out instead of dying a painful death. He believes that darkness is invincible, which means you need to adapt to it, bury your hopes deep in your heart, and just wait. He ends his story by saying that after a while, a fire will start that will save all of humanity, and that is what they are waiting for. Charlie chuckles at Sailor's words and says that he only justifies his actions with these fairy tales. The main character adds that if the fire kind thinks alike, then he will destroy them all. Sailor says that he is bored with this useless conversation with Charlie and begins to glow with quirky energy. After a few seconds, a fire ignites in his chest and he invites Charlie to behold the power of the fiery species. The main character rushes into battle, clasping two swords and preparing to launch a powerful two-handed attack. However, Sailor easily blocks the blow from the razor-sharp blades with her hand without receiving any damage. Trying to time the moment, Sailor throws a strong kick in hopes of throwing Charlie away. Charlie jumps back a little, trying to analyze his opponent and find the right moment to strike. However, despite all the attempts to strike on the sly from a variety of directions, Sailor always blocks them flawlessly. However, during one of these attacks, Sailor manages to catch Charlie making a mistake, and he explodes the ground beneath him using his power. The smoke clears and a badly maimed Charlie lies in the center of the crater. He puts his hand to his wound, earlier admitting that Sailor is a very formidable opponent. However, he notices that, among other things, his wounds are not healing despite the fact that he is in shadow form. Sailor approaches Charlie and tells him that he used a special skill called Flame Strike. He adds that Charlie could not defeat even him, and in the face of absolute power he will be absolutely helpless. Sailor says it's time to end this, but Charlie just smiles and expresses his agreement by using the Mark skill on him. Due to the fact that the Mark causes incredible fear in the victim, Sailor freezes in place, unable to even lift a finger. Waves of horror cover him, and he asks himself how he ended up here 
adding that he does not want to die. Charlie appears behind Sailor and says that he can feel the fear lurking deep in his heart. He adds that saving humanity is just an excuse and fear is the true reason for his actions. He prepares to deliver a finishing attack by crossing two swords into one and says that the entire fire kind is just a group of thugs. Sailor gathers all her will into a fist and overcomes the crippling fear, turns around rushing to attack Charlie. However, he is unable to react in time and Charlie impales him with his shadow sword. Sailor only manages to release a small stream of flame into Charlie's face and see that only the boy opposed him. He falls to the ground and mentally tells himself that he is not surprised by Charlie's fearlessness, since at his age, he was just as energetic. With his dying thoughts, he remembers that his ignorance and fearlessness have long since dissipated, and in the end, Charlie will suffer the same fate. Charlie tries to interrogate Sailor, but he gives up the ghost without saying a word to him. Meanwhile, in the physical world, a news reporter arrives at the scene of the fire and reports that the High End Company building is behind her. According to her, just an hour ago a fire broke out in the building, and several others escaped, as a result of which the building was completely charred. She also adds that they learned that many victims were able to escape thanks to a streamer with the nickname You. The correspondent continues his report, saying that the streamer rushed to save children who were kidnapped by others. However, after a few seconds, one of the eyewitnesses notices a group of kidnapped children and the silhouette of Charlie next to them and shouts that Brother Yeh has returned. The crowd begins to praise Charlie, shouting his nickname loudly and heading towards him. Charlie sits down with the rescued children and tells them that they can, adding that he will not go any further. The children joyfully hug Charlie, call him brother, and return to their parents. After some time, Charlie, exhausted from heavy fighting, enters his apartment. Lost in his thoughts, he does not immediately notice that Carol is sobbing on his sofa. As he approaches, he notices that his beloved looks pale and she cannot hold back her tears at all. Charlie apologizes for being so late, starting to spew nonsense about how he was stopped again on his way back from the store. Carol continues to cry and accuses Charlie of taking her for a childish fool if he really thinks she will fall for it. Charlie asks Carol if she was afraid that he would die. Carol gets off the couch and screams hysterically that it would be better if he died, swinging for a blow. However, Charlie carefully puts his hand up and gently stops Carol's blow. Carol demands that Charlie let her go, but he refuses, pulling her towards him and hugging her. Gently stroking her cheek, Charlie asks Carol if she has tried this yet, to which she doesn't understand and asks him what he means. Charlie tells Carol that she need not be afraid of anything, since they are no longer children. But she sincerely admits to him that she does not understand what he is talking about. Charlie continues to insist and admits that he has never tried this either and offers to fix it. Carol asks Charlie to be more clear, and he interrupts by carefully approaching and kissing her. A second later, Carol comes to her senses and knocks Charlie away with a strong blow, asking him what the hell he's doing. Undeterred, Charlie continues to spew utter nonsense, saying that he was really thirsty, so he did what he did. Covering her lips with her hand, Carol looks shyly at Charlie and asks him what he means. However, Charlie avoids answering by asking Carol if she is hungry, offering to heat up the food. Approaching the microwave, he mentally admits to himself that he has just been on the verge of life and death. However, from his point of view, it was definitely worth it, as he felt an incredible thrill in his stomach when he kissed his lover. Charlie's spirits immediately lift, and he says that this was the best reward for the battle in his life. Carol shyly watches Charlie dance enthusiastically and mentally calls him a fool. After a while, they sit down at the table and begin to eat dinner, exchanging glances at each other. Charlie decides to check how much his abilities have grown after the battle and checks his profile. Based on his account data, he has a new ability called Hidden Shadow, which allows him to dive into shadows and move freely between them. After studying the description of the ability, Charlie decides that it is a modified skill of a simple shadow form. He also notices that he began to see auras in people, based on which the red color of the aura is the aura of the enemy, green is the aura of an ally, and white is the civilian. Suddenly he focuses his gaze on Carol and begins to stare at her, confusing her. She asks him what he needs, warning him not to do anything strange again. However, Charlie continues to look at her and mentally wonders what the pink aura surrounding his beloved means. Charlie assumes that the pink aura is a sign that Carol has feelings for him and breaks into a goofy smile. Suddenly the two heroes' dinner is interrupted by the loud sounds of fireworks going off right in front of their house. The couple goes out onto the balcony and fascinated by the bright flashes in the sky. Charlie decides to break the silence and asks Carol if anything is known about Fireview. Carol looks closely at Charlie and asks him where he heard about this. Without waiting for a clear answer, she says that this information was mentioned in her father's notes. Carol says that the Firekind is a group that operates on its own, pursuing only its own goals. Carol warns Charlie that this organization brainwashes people, so it is better not to mess with it, adding that if he finds out, go to the Night Watch, as there is a reward of 500,000 yuan for this information. Charlie's face distorts into a grimace of sincere surprise and disappointment in his own life. Carol asks the main character what bothered him so much, but he says that everything is fine, 
mentally mourning his lost million yuan. He asks Carol if there are other similar organizations besides Fireview and what the reward is for them, to which she replies that she has not heard of them. Carol asks him why he is interested in this, to which Charlie simply replies that he is thinking about ways to make money. Carol says there are awards for other organizations, but one that stands out is one called Enlightenment. Charlie details, and she says that this organization is an ally of the Night's Watch, but is fundamentally different from them, since they believe that humanity will be defeated. Carol adds that this organization is looking for a way to escape from here, saying that one of the options they are considering is moving to another planet. Charlie says that this all reminds him of some kind of science fiction movie, adding that spaceships cannot be built for everyone, to which Carol replies that in this matter, it is not necessary to rely on technology. She says that others live in another world, where there is no technology, but they strive to bypass all the cracks and get into our world. From her point of view, if the Enlightenment achieves the same results as others, then it will be very difficult to stop the spinning wheel. After some time, Charlie reflects that the holidays have already passed and ordinary people have gone to school and work. He continues his reasoning, recalling that since he ascended to the second rank, he was able to calmly exterminate others of the first level without any difficulty and significantly increased his life expectancy. However, the days passed as usual, and it was time to get ready for training camp. The night before leaving, Uncle Lee returns and tells Charlie that he heard about the discovery of his ability, adding that he was very impressed with it. Charlie asks Uncle Lee where he has been and wonders what happened to his arm. Uncle replies that everything is fine, adding that this year he has a lot of workload and almost no free time, after which he says that in addition to Charlie's golden light, something else has been added. The main character tries to find out from his uncle what ability they discovered in him, but he only gives evasive answers. Uncle Lee mentally says that now he understands why Charlie seemed unusual to him before, because he not only failed the tests, but showed himself well and ended up at the sixth level. However, he still thinks that there is some kind of mistake here, and he will not be able to become special. Charlie tells his uncle that he recently met a man named Murphy, and he told him that his uncle was a general. He asks Uncle Lee if this is true, and he reluctantly says that it is true. Charlie is delighted and tells his uncle that he is one of the members of the strongest five. Uncle says that this is all in the past, since he was about 40 when he left the front line. He recalls his youth, saying that during those times he was full of energy and fought against countless enemies. He continues the story by saying that back then his goals were quite simple and were to exterminate all others for the sake of everyone's safety. But there were too many of them, and it took more than 20 years. The uncle says that in the end his wife died from the pollution of others, and he had to change his activities. Uncle says that this time there are quite strong others in Beidou, but Charlie assures him that he will never give up and will cope with all the challenges. Charlie says that he also wants to become a general, just like his uncle. Uncle Lee says that there is no turning back now that he has been spotted and takes a necklace out of his pocket, asking Charlie to hang it on his body. Charlie asks him what the pendant is, to which his uncle replies that it is a secret thing that will allow him to hear many more different sounds after he puts it on. He adds that it will significantly strengthen his willpower if he wears it long enough, but this pendant also increases negative emotions, so it should be worn at intervals of three days. Also, according to uncle, it can be activated when unusual energy is detected, releasing impurities, allowing for a significant increase in combat power in a very short period of time, but this can only be used once. Charlie examines the pendant and asks his uncle if it is something from the shadow layer. Uncle Lee praises Charlie's knowledge, saying that this thing is indeed from there, adding that such forbidden things come from another world, and a certain fee is charged for their use. He says that the cost of use depends only on the strength and skill of the wearer, so if his strength is above level 5, he can safely wear it. Uncle Lee adds that the most amazing thing about this pendant is that it recognizes people. Charlie admits that he is very intrigued and places the pendant around his neck. Uncle Lee walks around Charlie and asks him how he is feeling, to which he replies that at first glance, nothing has changed. Uncle Lee says that it appears that Charlie's willpower is counteracting the pendant's influence, which means he can rest easy. After a while, Uncle Lee leaves and Charlie goes to bed, forgetting to take off his pendant. Suddenly, the pendant begins to tremble violently and accumulate dark energy in itself. Having absorbed a sufficient amount of energy, the pendant forms a portal, pulling Charlie into it. Waking up, Charlie asks himself where he is, looking around. A split second later, his ears begin to be pierced by the loud scream of some woman, located in some kind of bubble, and Charlie decides to move on. Walking further, he sees images of various wearers of this pendant and their misadventures. After looking through the pendant's memories, Charlie realizes that all its carriers ended very badly. However, suddenly he hears a mysterious voice in his head calling him Master and darkness begins to fall before his eyes. The next day, Carol is driving with Charlie in the car, and the girl yawns tiredly. Charlie asks her if she slept well, to which she replies that she couldn't sleep all night because she was so nervous.
The girl asks Charlie how he spent that night, to which he replies that he slept without his hind legs in the form of wonderful dreams. However, he suddenly realizes that he cannot remember anything about his dreams, except for some vague images of a shadow pendant. Charlie puts his hand on Carol's shoulder and tells her that if she's tired, she can lie down on him and rest, giving her word that he won't do anything. Another quarrel between lovers is interrupted by Uncle Lou, sitting behind the wheel, who tells Carol that there are quite a lot of bad people in the training camp with whom you should behave more seriously. Carol tells her father that she will certainly do so, and Charlie is unloaded with thoughts about whether his uncle is hinting at him. Uncle Lou tells the guys to follow the instructor's instructions, and if anything happens to call him immediately, to which Carol replies that he talks about it all the time. Charlie confidently tells his uncle not to worry, adding that he will always be there for Carol to protect her, to which the uncle only mentally says that Charlie is the reason for his concern. After some time, the car with the heroes arrives at their destination, and they get out of Uncle Lou's car. As he leaves, Charlie takes Carol's hand, causing Uncle Lou genuine anger and anger. Carol yanks her hand away from Charlie and asks him what he's doing, adding that Uncle Lou is still watching. Charlie cheerfully tells her that everything is fine, since they have always been together, and there is nothing wrong with it, to which Carol asks him to stop with a smile. Carol and Charlie approach the platform and hear a train approaching the boarding platform. They pass the carriage, and the train begins its departure to the Night Watch training camp. The doors close behind our heroes, and the announcer in the carriage says that the carriage heading to the training camp is moving non-stop, and the estimated time of arrival is 20 minutes. Charlie admits to Carol that he didn't expect to see so many people here, but something tells him that they all came from different gathering points. She adds that everyone in the carriage has a fairly high test score, which suggests that they either have a high level of willpower or extraordinary abilities, and they need training to quickly deal with others of the first rank. Charlie is theatrically surprised by what Carol says, mentally saying that with his current strength, he can handle second-rank monsters. Carol advises Charlie not to think so lightly about this training, as it will clearly not be easy. She asks him to wait until he arrives at the camp, saying that then he will taste real suffering. Charlie proudly states that he is confident that he will not have any problems. The train continues its journey to the camp, but after a long time, it does not arrive at the end point. Charlie wakes up to Carol tapping his shoulder and calling his name. Reluctantly opening his eyes, the main character asks her about what happened. According to the announcement, the trip takes about 20 minutes, but they have been on the road for about 40 and still have not arrived. Charlie says that this is all strange and the way it should be, after which he turns out the window and notices that fog is surrounding them. The awakened passengers also look out the window, and one of them says that this fog is unusual. The train stops abruptly, and all standing passengers fall to the floor of the car. The announcer in the carriage says that they have arrived at the training camp and warns them that the doors are opening. After looking around, the students do not find anyone meeting them, and Charlie decides to get out of the car first. Carol screams at Charlie to come back and runs out after him, afraid to lose sight of him. After walking a few steps forward, Charlie looks down and discovers blood splattered across the platform. Carol gets a little scared, but Charlie decides to check if it's all a prank, and leans down, running his finger through the puddle of red liquid. After carefully examining his finger, he comes to the conclusion that it is indeed human blood. The other students start to get nervous, asking how someone could get killed at the training camp. Charlie says that others are probably involved here, and asks the students to notify the night watch about everything and return back as quickly as possible. Carol asks Charlie where he's going, but he nonchalantly replies that he needs to use the restroom. Carol calls out to Charlie, trying to keep him close to her, but seeing that he doesn't hear her, she makes a strong-willed decision. Having overcome her fear, Carol runs away after Charlie to help him in case of danger. Students take out their phones and discover that there is no mobile network signal. Without thinking twice, the students decide to follow Charlie's example and also get out of the car to investigate. After a while, Charlie comes out of the restroom, admitting that he finally feels better. While thinking about his life, he does not notice how someone else in the form of a dog attacks him from behind. However, turning around at the last moment, Charlie only sees a stone flying at the dog at great speed, turning its body into a bloody mess. Turning his head, he notices Carol standing nearby and asks her why she was there. Carol starts yelling at the main character, accusing him of not understanding how dangerous things can be, and asks him what she will tell Uncle Lee if something happens to Charlie. Charlie asks Carol to calm down and listen to his suggestion. Carol agrees to calm down and tells Charlie that she's listening to him carefully. Charlie says he thinks everything that happens is part of the training. Carol asks him when the training began, to which Charlie replies that the training began as soon as they left the carriage. Carol asks him why he believes this was all planned and what evidence he has. Charlie asks Carol to pay attention to the new one who just exploded. The girl analyzes the monster and says that this other is a very low rank and such a weak opponent would not have the courage to attack the training camp. Charlie praises Carol for her intelligence by patting her on the shoulder, to which she snaps, saying that they are in a difficult situation. Charlie says that if the others had actually carried out a raid, 
the Night's Watch would have known about it immediately. From his point of view, the Night's Watch deliberately extended the time spent in the subway car to scare them and used thick fog to recreate an atmosphere of fear. The main character sums up his thoughts by saying that under such pressure, the weak and the strong stand out very much. Charlie also takes the opportunity to say that he is the strongest, so he has nothing to worry about. While talking, Charlie does not notice how a small pack of other dogs is sneaking up on him. Charlie immediately hides behind Carol, theatrically asking her to use her powers, to which she reminds him of the words that he is the strongest. Charlie decides to justify himself by saying that if he wants to do something, the dogs won't have the slightest chance. And that's not fair. With these words, he pushes Carol forward, saying that this is a great chance for her to demonstrate her abilities. His displays of incredible heroism are observed through video cameras by night watch officers. Carol takes down the dogs in a matter of seconds using her otherworldly powers. Charlie runs up to his lover and tries to support her, shouting out solemn congratulations. Carol does not appreciate Charlie's generosity and attacks him with her fists, accusing him of inaction, to which he tells her that this shows his trust. After intercepting one of Carol's blows, Charlie tells her that now is not the time to fight and points to a map hanging on the wall. Coming closer to her, Charlie says that this map can be used to find a way out and offers to study it more closely. Carol asks Charlie if they need to get out of this place to undergo training, while Charlie continues to study the map and finds Sector C on it, which is called the Shadow Field. Carol says that the Shadow Field, in her opinion, is an imitation of the Shadow Layer and suggests that this is the most dangerous place on the site. Charlie says that the most dangerous places in such situations are, on the contrary, the safest, and invites her to go there, promising to protect her. After a while, several students run out from the darkness towards them, loudly screaming for help. Ignoring Carol and Charlie, they run on, and our heroes wonder what could have scared the elite students. Suddenly, Carol points behind the main character and yells at him to be careful. Turning around, Charlie sees another in front of him in the form of a huge multi-headed snake. The snake immediately attacks him with all its heads, but Charlie manages to jump back without receiving a single scratch. Charlie notes that this other has the first rank, which means that if this creature ends up in a training camp, then everything can lead to deaths. Carol engages the other, flanking him and activating her otherworldly abilities. However, the snake discovers Carol and attacks her, opening its mouth full of the island like a razor of teeth. However, at the last moment, Charlie saves her by throwing away the snake's head with a powerful kick. Grabbing his girlfriend's hand, he tells her to run and they retreat as quickly as possible. The snake rushes after them, and Charlie tries to lead Carol to safety. He chooses one of the corridors and rushes into it, when suddenly he hears the door slamming behind him. Turning around, he suddenly realizes that Carol has disappeared, and he is behind closed doors all alone. The Night Watch watches and asks what happened to this snake and why its fighting power is not suppressed by the crystals. One of the employees says that for unknown reasons they lost control. Another employee offers to go out and rein in the monster, but Commander Murphy, who suddenly appears, suggests waiting. The commander offers to leave everything as it is, expressing a desire to monitor Charlie's abilities. Charlie, meanwhile, studies the door and comes to the conclusion that it is somehow unusual. Taking a closer look at the door, he realizes that the glass on it is made of a material that allows sunlight to pass through, noting that the view behind it suddenly changes. He opens the door, expressing the hope that after several such attempts, he might be able to meet Carol. However, he is immediately attacked by the same snake from which they were running away. Being found by surprise, Charlie does not have time to jump away from the snake's attack, and it grabs him with its teeth. Trying to free himself, Charlie strikes her many times, aiming for her eyes and teeth. He throws the snake away under the pressure of his blows and falls to the ground, telling himself that he has almost lost control of himself. However, to his surprise, after a split second, the shadow form activates without his knowledge. Charlie wonders what happened, trying to understand what caused this event, when suddenly something lands next to him. Turning around, he notices a humanoid other on whose body there are many eyes. Everyone present in the observation department is surprised, because they did not expect that another force reaching almost the second rank would appear during the training. The otherworldly monster extends its hand in front of itself and sends several waves of green energy at Charlie. Charlie easily dodges but does not notice how he lands on a trap left by an otherworldly creature. Magic waves attack the main character. He is grabbed by the head from unbearable pain. Another decides to take advantage of the situation and jumps on Charlie, intending to finish him off with one blow. However, Charlie suddenly stops pretending and intercepts the other by sharply grabbing him by the throat in flight. Laughing heartily, he tells the creature that such tricks do not work on him. Having dealt with the enemy, he begins to absorb monsters using the Shadow Bite skill. After consuming the creature, he consults the database to better study the opponents he has just encountered. The entry in the bestiary states that the creature he encountered is called a Snake, a low-level other with several heads. He also checks the records of another other called the Faceless, 
and notices a note that states that this subspecies was the descendant of a lower-ranking shadow species. Charlie theorizes that his stalker subspecies is hostile to the shadow species, which is why the others attacked him, and then wonders why the instructors sent such powerful others for training. The most terrible thing, from his point of view, is that the instructors saw his uniform, which means there is no point in hiding. He decides to try to remove it, and with various gestures and commands, he orders the form to leave, but nothing comes of it. Suddenly he hears a guttural growl, and looking up he notices a huge creature watching him with dozens of eyes. Charlie activates his shadow claws and notes that the eyesight won't be gotten rid of that easily this time. The Nightwatch officers watching what is happening lose contact with the cameras and begin to panic to determine the cause. Suddenly, specialists from the technical department burst in and report that the entire information system has failed. He also adds that contact with two instructors has been lost, leaving everyone present in a daze. An old man with a cane appears in the room and says that he did not expect such a mess to reign in the training camp. He looks sternly at everyone present and asks them whether they consider themselves worthy instructors. Murphy addresses the old man, calling him Chief Miller, and asks him what they should do. The old man gives the command to honor everyone who entered the shadow field, as well as remove the fog and stop the evaluation procedure, additionally sending people to maintain order. Once everyone goes about their business, he asks Instructor Murphy to stay behind. He tells him that he is the calmest of all and asks about what is hidden in the shadow field of this camp. The old man adds that as soon as the students entered the shadow field, an anomaly arose that could be seen even with the naked eye. Murphy honestly answers that the shadow field in this camp arose from a forbidden place in which a person who had contact with others began to sprout eyeballs on his body until they covered the entire body. According to Murphy, this zone is inhabited by a powerful other who, under normal circumstances, would only bring with him lower species not exceeding the first rank. But this time something went wrong. Miller asks Murphy what rank this other has, to which he replies that he has been in a viable state for about half a month. Miller lowers his eyes and says that in this case, only a person of the fourth rank can compare with him in strength. Murphy says that if you don't take the initiative, everything should go well, adding that even if a person below rank three falls into the shadow field, nothing will happen. He also adds that if a person of the fourth rank gets into the zone, then complete chaos will reign and others will continue to develop and mutate. The old man asks Murphy if he knows about the first-year students of the fourth rank, to which he replies that the probability of this is extremely small, but not zero. He adds that regardless of rank, something has affected them, and this is most likely the end for Charlie. Charlie encounters another low-ranking monster and cuts his way through it. Having gotten the hang of it, he continues to run away from others, calling them slow and shouting at them that they will never be able to catch up with him. However, behind his bravado, he does not notice how some others shoot sound waves at him and misses the attack in the back. After recovering from the attack, he is surprised that monsters are capable of such things. Looking around the crowd of others, he notes that now others of the second rank have arrived here. Charlie decides to give them a fight, saying that he will now show them the strength of the second rank. However, his attempts to activate the shadow blades lead to no result, and he looks at his hands in confusion. Focusing on his inner energy, he realizes that his abilities are partially sealed, Looking up at the others, he notices that they surprisingly do not attack him, but talk to each other in an incomprehensible language. He wonders why they don't attack, and assumes that they were frightened by his incredible strength. However, after a minute, the monsters part, and a huge other comes out to Charlie, holding two curved swords in his hands. Charlie looks at his opponent and realizes with horror that in front of him stands another of the third rank. Charlie decides that he has nowhere to run and takes the fight, preparing for a fight. The other stabs him, and Charlie decides to block it by crossing his claws in front of him. However, the collision of the otherworldly weapon and the shadow claws causes an explosion, throwing Charlie far into the wall. Charlie dusts himself off and realizes that he can't do this again, otherwise it will end badly. He understands that in his current state, even the second rank is a threat, let alone the third. Quickly assessing his chances of winning, Charlie decides to confuse the other with shadow threads in order to hinder his movement. Taking advantage of the gain time, Charlie begins to quickly retreat. However, the shadow threads do not hold him back for long, and he easily breaks them on his body. Within a few seconds, he starts chasing Charlie, and the main character notes his unsurpassed speed. Having caught up with Charlie, the otherworldly monster attacks him with a sword, and the main character only miraculously manages to dodge this attack. The sword gets stuck in the asphalt, and Charlie decides to take advantage of this, using the chase skill and repeatedly damaging others. Charlie notices that the continuous attacks are harming the monster, and decides to accumulate enough energy to kill it. However, the other one quickly comes to his senses after a series of attacks from Charlie and throws him away with a powerful blow to the face. The force of the impact sends Charlie crashing into the stone building again and punching a hole in it. 
Looking up, he notices that the otherworldly monster does not stop pursuing. However, having approached Charlie at a certain distance, the monster suddenly stops, surprising the main character. Charlie watches the otherworldly monster and mentally tries to understand what happened and why his opponent stopped moving. Looking around, he finally notices that he is actually in a training camp. Charlie doesn't understand what's going on, but notes that this place feels very much like a shadow layer to him. After thinking a little, he admits to himself that this place is even more frightening than the shadow layer. Suddenly, the shadow monster interrupts its inactivity and rushes to attack Charlie. Charlie dodges a powerful blow and decides he needs to run for his life. Charlie uses all his strength to run and not stop. Suddenly, a dark haze begins to cover the alley in front of him, and he begins to think that his eyesight has begun to fail him. Suddenly, Charlie feels that he has stopped touching the ground with his feet, and looking around, realizes that he is in some kind of energy shell. Charlie is trying to understand what this place is, as if someone takes control of his body and begins to drag him somewhere. Charlie tries to regain control, mentally the one who controls him stop, adding that only he is the owner of his body. After a while, this stops, and Charlie regains control of his body. However, he notices a dark sphere flying towards him. She penetrates Charlie's body, beginning to envelop him with dark energy. Suddenly, in Charlie's head, someone starts talking about waiting for him, calling him the Lord of the Shadow. A few seconds later, Charlie finds himself inside some kind of prism, drifting in outer space. Charlie asks out loud where he is, to which the entity living in the prism tells him that they are on the border between two worlds. Charlie turns around to find whoever is talking to him, to which the entity invites him to plunge deeper into the shadows. The entity tells Charlie that they are derivatives of the same thing, and there is almost no difference between them. Charlie calmly strikes the wall of the prism, scaring the entity, to which you ask him what he is doing, after which the main character replies that he is just eliminating another one. The entity responds that Charlie is rushing things too quickly and risks losing skills such as the Master of the Deep. Charlie says that he does not have time for this, since he must get out of here as quickly as possible to save Carol, but the entity invites him to see for himself. Looking up, Charlie discovers a huge eye watching him. Charlie asks the entity if the creature he saw is the one that blocked part of his abilities. The entity confirms Charlie's suspicions, saying that the sparkling appearance and the appearance of shadows are sworn enemies, adding that Charlie is precisely descended from the appearance of shadows, despite being special. Charlie assumes that it was the entity from the prism who saved him, and asks about the reasons for such generosity, to which she replies that she has been waiting for him for a very long time. The entity explains his decision by saying that he was waiting for a person as strong as himself. The entity says that he used to be a very high-ranking person. The entity adds that he had such qualities as power and responsibility, and was also the commander of the group. However, according to him, due to an accident, his body disintegrated into countless fragments and fell into this world, where the sparkling species took and preserved the remains and his soul. The guest from the prism continues the story, saying that this other was quite capricious and turned away from him, after which he used his powers to his advantage, strengthening his power. The prism guest reaches out from his prison, saying that he has been waiting for someone of the shadow kind, asking Charlie to help him end this. He tells Charlie that later he can become his master, and he will obey him. However, Charlie, unimpressed by such speeches, only slaps the entity in the face. The entity becomes enraged, and asks Charlie what the hell he is doing, adding that he agreed to help him figure out the appearance of the eyes. Charlie replies that the guy who was left without the last pair of pants has no right to set conditions on him. He also questions the guest from the prism about whether he will truly obey him. The entity replies that none of this matters, since Charlie will not be able to escape from here anyway. The angry creature from the prism tells Charlie that he will become its host, adding that it should be a great honor for the main character. After listening to pathetic speeches, Charlie grabs the entity by the throat, launching shadow tentacles into it. Charlie says that the entity, according to its own stories, used to be strong, but now he looks like a weakling. The entity replies that it has a rank 6 shadow species, so Charlie's continued existence will be impossible. Charlie begins to absorb the entity from the prism using shadow tentacles, while the guest from the prism does not believe that a mere second-ranking person could get the better of him. Charlie completes the absorption of the enemy, fully restoring his strength. He feels an otherworldly eye appear on his chest, restoring his strength. Meanwhile, the Night Watch instructors shield the students and ask them to immediately take the anti-pollution medicine and not leave the formation. Carol, surrounded by instructors, mentally hopes that Charlie is okay. Meanwhile, a group of others sneak up behind her and attack her, trying to take her by surprise. Carol notices the enemy and, using her powers, stops them in place. One of the Night Watch employees notices this and kills the stunned monsters. The patrol officers thank Carol for her help, saying that if it weren't for her, the fight would have been much more difficult. One of the fighters says that everyone needs to get ready to leave here. Turning around, he does not have time to react to the attack of the otherworldly monster and misses the attack in the face. Knocked unconscious by the blow, the fighter falls to the ground with a thud right in front of Carol's feet. 
Carol looks around and notices how the big-eyed man is trying to get close to her in order to kill her. However, at the last moment, squad leader Murphy manages to come to the rescue and kills the monster. Murphy mentally tells himself that these others are third-rank beings, noting that the situation was worse than they thought. He chastises the fighters, saying that they were almost attacked on the sly, despite orders to remain vigilant. Looking back at the group of survivors, he reflects that others of the third rank decided to attack them and assumes that there is a special fourth rank in this group. Murphy waves at the students and tells them to follow him, but Carol tells him to stop. She says that she was together with Charlie, but now he has disappeared somewhere. Murphy mentally suggests that Charlie might be together with the sight of the eyes and guesses that Carol is probably in a close relationship with Charlie. Suddenly, a huge rank three other appears behind Murphy and swings his sword. However, Murphy disarms him with a slight movement of his hand and throws him as far as possible. Having covered Carol with his body, Murphy realizes that the other has come for her, which means she is also under threat. Murphy orders other fighters to accompany the students and leave the rest to him, after which he rushes to attack the monsters. Another, thrown back by the captain, rises to his feet and rushes to attack. The captain decides to use a special technique called the Eye of the Wind and lifts the monster into the air. However, after a few seconds, the other flies out of the tornado, drawing his sword again. Murphy tries to prevent his escape, but is caught by another kind of eye. Murphy's abilities disappear and he tries to understand what happened to him. Turning around, he notices the silhouette of a huge otherworldly monster from the sight of his eyes. The monster uses its all-consuming hypnotic gaze, and all fighters in a large area fall under its influence. Murphy loses consciousness and falls helplessly to the asphalt. Carol tries to gather all her will into a fist, but she realizes that her body does not obey her, and her consciousness is clouded. The girl admits to herself that despite the fact that she has mentally prepared for everything, she still feels powerless when faced with others. Realizing that her last moment has come, she expresses hope that Charlie was saved and will live. A split second later, Charlie comes to the rescue, intercepting a piece of rebar that the monster threw at her. Carefully placing the unconscious Carol on the ground, Charlie looks around, assessing the number of opponents. Rising to his feet, he turns his head towards the monsters and decides that it's time to put his acquired skills into practice. He tells the monsters that they have forgotten that the shadow species is dominant in this area and rushes to attack. Raising his hand upward, he summons a whirlpool of shadows that surrounds otherworldly monsters. Charlie greets his opponents by saying that they have entered his home territory. After a split second, the opponents' heads begin to explode one by one from lightning-fast strikes. Charlie moves past opponents, blasting their bodies with his mind. A crippled other of the third rank appears in front of him, and he says that they have met again. Undeterred by any seals, Charlie summons the shadow swords and says that it is now his turn to attack. Without allowing the enemy to come to his senses, Charlie makes a lightning-fast dash, flying through the enemy. A second later, the other's body explodes, shattering into small pieces behind Charlie. The last living enemy remains the main alien of the eye type, who is going to attack Charlie with powerful spells. However, Charlie manages to get to him faster, and he pierces his eye with a shadow sword. By activating the chase skill, Charlie finishes off the formidable enemy with decapitation. Charlie takes a breath, standing under the bloody rain from the body of another and rejoicing at the power of the sight of the shadows. After the sight of the eyes ceased to exist, all of his spells ceased to work, so Charlie decides to absorb the remaining opponents. Charlie says that even at his second rank, he was able to kill another third rank in a matter of seconds, so he understands why the eyesight mainly works in groups. He absorbs the body of a powerful opponent and thanks him for the vivid emotions. Meanwhile, a group of fighters from the Night Watch comes to the rescue, saying that the signal from the previous group is interrupted somewhere here. Charlie notices them and admits that they showed up a little at the wrong time. Having arrived at the scene, the unit commander orders all the wounded to be removed as quickly as possible. The squad's medic says she needs anti-pollution drugs because people could die. The commander says that they need several people to be able to block the view of the eyes. After some time, all the victims are evacuated to the hospital for medical care. Charlie decides not to waste time and brags about his absolutely non-fictional adventures. His exciting story is interrupted by Carol, hitting him on the cheek with pills. She asks him how he can show off after so many injuries. Charlie decides to try his luck again and asks Carol to treat his wounds herself. Carol happily agrees to his request and opens the jar of medicine. Moving closer to Charlie, she pours medicine onto his wound, which begins to severely burn his hand. Charlie jumps up in his chair and starts screaming dramatically throughout the hallway. He tells her that this medicine must be taken and asks her if she wishes him to die. The main character asks Carol if she is offended by him, to which she replies that he just disappeared, forcing her to look back and worry. Charlie understands his lover's feelings and says that he is very sorry that this happened, trying to say that he was transported by otherworldly forces. However, Carol gently touches his cheeks and tells him that he doesn't have to apologize to her. She adds that she only asks him to never do that again, and looks at Charlie worriedly. 
Charlie says that he will try not to scare her, to which Carol says that she noticed another strange thing, adding that she fainted from an attack by another, but woke up safe and sound. Charlie says that there is nothing strange about this, but Carol says that it was Brother Ye who saved her. Charlie says that Carol might have been imagining things, expressing doubts that Brother Ye was able to get into the training camp. However, Carol adamantly claims that she is sure that it was Brother Yo. She adds that she feels like she has known Brother Ye for a long time. Carol stares at Charlie and he asks her if she doubts him. Carol tells him that in her opinion, Brother Ye is not as half-baked as Charlie, and he just snorts resentfully in response. Charlie's lover asks him if Brother Ye could study with them, to which Charlie replies that this is very unlikely. He justifies his position by saying that Brother Ye is very strong, unique, and has a keen sense of justice and stunning appearance, which means he cannot be an ordinary student. Carol agrees with his arguments, but clarifies how he knows that Brother Ye is handsome, to which Charlie only asks her not to be distracted from the main idea. Suddenly, Instructor Murphy approaches Charlie and calls out to him. Carol and Charlie ask the instructor how he is feeling, to which he replies that he will recover quickly. Carol says that thanks to him and the other instructors, there were no casualties. Murphy responds that everything happened because of their negligence, so they were obligated to resolve the situation. Murphy tells Charlie that he didn't see him among the rescued students and asks him if he got out alone, to which Charlie confidently replies that he got through alone. Murphy praises Charlie, saying he's looking forward to his next performance. He takes out a special sensor and says that he will check Charlie and Carol for contamination right here because there are too many people in the treatment room. After quickly checking the guys, he says that no contamination was found, so they should take their medicine and return to their rooms. Murphy says goodbye to the guys, saying that he will go check on other people and leaves to the side. Moving further away, he discovers that Charlie is a second-ranking man. He mentally reasons that this explains how he got out on his own, but still doesn't answer how he was able to resist the sight of the eyes. Also, in his opinion, it is surprising that Charlie's pollution index is zero, but this is impossible, since by killing others, you are drowning in pollution. Charlie asks Carol whose name she said before Brother Ye's arrival, to which she replies that it was her father's name. Murphy reflects on the test results, realizing that Charlie is keeping many secrets. Charlie arrives at Yonghai University, which includes a full-fledged educational environment, and looks at the girls passing by. Impressed by other people's stockings, he once again arouses the jealous wrath of his beloved Carol. Loudly calling Charlie an idiot, she unhappily turns her back and walks away. She says she's heading to the dorm, and Charlie offers to take her since she doesn't know these places well. Carol asks Charlie if this is an excuse to look at other girls, to which he absolutely sincerely replies that she saw through him. Having thanked Charlie for his honesty with another bump on his head, she walks away, asking him not to talk to him anymore. Fred approaches Charlie and asks her why he angered Carol again. After looking at Charlie a little more, he says that he hasn't changed at all. Charlie asks Fred when he got so fat, to which he replies that his ability is gluttony, which gives him strength. He adds that initially his abilities were not suitable for university, but after lowering the bar, he was able to pass. Fred says he will walk Charlie to his room and asks him where he is going, to which he replies that he is going to the first building. After some time, they arrive at the first building of the hostel, and Charlie notes that it looks a lot like a hotel. Fred tells Charlie that this dorm is for the best students at the training camp, emphasizing that the facilities here are top-notch. He adds that in addition to the hostel, there is also a small garden, a gym, and a library. They arrive at room 101, and Fred tells Charlie that it is his room, but notices that it is unlocked. Entering the room, they find senior students taking charge of Charlie's room. Noticing that someone has arrived, one of the students stands up, saying that Charlie is in the wrong building. Making a satisfied face, he says that this room now belongs to him. Fred says that this is all complete nonsense, and there are no such rules at this university, and never have been. One of the seniors asks Fred if he has any complaints, to which he confidently replies that this is a freshman dorm, so they need to move away. A senior student opens the front door to the room and begins to loudly shout that the freshman does not respect the rules of the dormitory. Hearing these cries, a lot of people from senior courses come running, saying that now they will help the newcomers understand the rules. Charlie puts his hand on Fred's shoulder and tells him not to worry so much about it. He adds that their opponents, after all, are seniors, so they can't spoil the first impression. He adds that, at the end of the day, high school students take on too much. The bullies do not appreciate such words and attack Charlie with their fists, telling him to pray. Charlie prepares for a glorious slaughter and clenches his fist, awakening his power. However, the upperclassman behind him bursts into flames, forcing everyone to retreat. Turning around, Charlie notices that this senior has a pupil-like ability. Bully asks Charlie his name and he calmly gives it. The bully says that Charlie shouldn't have gotten into trouble today and invites him to fight in the arena for this room. Charlie agrees with his proposal, adding that one fight will not be enough. He points to the other students, saying that they will have to fight him too. Rumors about the upcoming battle spread in the blink of an eye, and all the students do is talk about it. 
everyone gathers at the stadium and takes their seats. The Night Watch employee completes the registration of the participants and tells them that they can now choose their weapons and equipment. The bully speaks, and his support team haughtily says that they can only sympathize with the newbie. Fred tells Charlie that it's not too late to leave, but he confidently replies that he knows what he's doing. He approaches the weapon rack and begins to sort through the blades, trying to find the one that suits him best. While Charlie is busy choosing a weapon, his opponent takes a position, choosing a spear as his weapon. Holding his weapon out in front of him, he calls Charlie over, telling him to stop stalling. Charlie says he just needed time to decide which weapon would suit him best. Bully says Charlie hasn't even chosen his defense and says showing off won't help him at all. The bully loses his temper and charges at Charlie, screaming that he'll crush him in a second. Charlie notes that his opponent is also a shadow wielder, saying that this is becoming increasingly curious. The crowd roars, chanting Toughnut's name and yelling for him to teach arrogant Charlie a lesson. After reaching Charlie, Toughnut dives into the shadows, appearing behind him to launch a surprise attack. At the moment of impact, a shadow flash appears, and both participants in the duel disappear from view of the excited crowd. Once the smoke clears, everyone finds Toughnut defeated, and Charlie standing over him, showing his disappointment in his opponent.